G'day sports fans and welcome back to the live coverage of the LATAM League final and when we say final we really do mean it. The grand final is upon us. Riley Knight joined by Ollie and for the first time for the broadcast Geo as well. She has swum back <laughs> yeah. through central London and uh, my goodness me the adventures you've had Geo mm. but the adventures that the players will be having in our grand final are what we focus on now. Team 1 facing off against Ninjas in Pajamas, who just beat out Team Liquid in a three-map series there. Geo, I don't know how much you managed to catch. I don't know how much underwater reception your phone had, so you yeah. could watch on the Twitch broadcast as you saw. But obviously, NIP facing off against Team 1. We've got a great game in our hands. One of the up-and-coming teams in Team 1 facing off against a titan of the BR6. I'm really excited about it, especially because NIP and T1 haven't had an opportunity to face against each other in the Copa Elite 6 yet. So the last time they played against each other was in the regular season of Stage 2 of the BR6. And since then, we've seen Team 1 really kind of, I don't know, find themselves a little bit. I think back towards the beginning of the stage, they were still a little bit wobbly on their legs. Um, NIP have faced more challenges too, which they have seemed to have risen from quite a bit throughout the, the playoff bracket, at least here in Copa. So to kind of have them meeting here, it does feel like that clash of titans. For those of you just joining us for the first time, welcome, by all means, welcome. But uh, the people to my left and right here, they are the regular casting team for the BR6. They know these teams in and out. They know what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. Ollie, as we head into this match, can you give us a bit of a picture here, mate, as to what we can expect? We know NIP are dominant, but how much better are they than Team 1? Is this going to be a whitewash? It's very difficult to say. I think there's things that favour both sides going into this, and that's just sort of situational things on the day. For example, you look toward Team 1. They've been on break for quite some time now. They've been waiting a good three, maybe four hours at this stage for this next game. Obviously, they've been preparing and getting ready inside of that. And you flip over toward the side of NIP, who we've already touted as this tournament team, a team that is very capable and very comfortable in and amongst a lot of games happening in a short period of time. That's really where we see this team thrive. They've just come off the back of a 2-1 victory over Liquid. They've had an hour to catch the breath and to reset themselves, and now they're going to be going in. I think there's advantages to be played on both sides here. The way that NIP look at the moment is very dangerous. That's something that you've got to try and take into account here. Um, the games that we saw Furia in Team 1 play, they were a little bit more clear-cut, whereas NIP have really had to scrap to get to this point. So there's really pros and cons, I think, lying on, on both of these teams' shoulders at the moment, and it really depends on how they step up over the course of the next couple of hours. I mean, it's not going to be a, a complete surprise if Team 1 win. We're talking about NIP having, you know, an advantage and perhaps even a significant advantage just, just based on the calibre of the players on their roster, Geo. But Team 1 have been so impressive, particularly in uh, Stage 2 of the group uh, here. They have... Man, they've done some hard work, eh? Yeah, a team one, as I said, they looked maybe a little bit wobbly at the very start of the stage where they kind of just looked like they were getting used to being back in the competition, I suppose, hot off of SI, um, which all in and of itself was a real new experience for them because they made it into the playoffs. And I think for a lot of people around the world who aren't super familiar with them, they learned of this incredible team. But it didn't take long for Team One uh, to to really find themselves in uh, in Stage Two of the BR6. I mean, they got, what, 10 wins? 10 wins? That's kind of nuts. So, um, yeah, no, they really had a, a wild time. Let's have a look at how we've got to this point in the proceedings here as we head into our grand final. Of course, the Copa Elite Six, the LATAM League final, it began with a group stage uh, where the 10 teams from across the LATAM region were split into two different groups and they duked out. We had a couple of upsets, a couple of surprises throughout the group stage. We saw ultimately FaZe Clan get knocked out of the uh, of the cup, which came as a big surprise to people who obviously would have backed this team to the hilt. They're one of the titans of the BR6. We thought they'd come ready to swing, but unfortunately, they swung out and ended up bombing out as well. And Phoenix Esports was the uh, surprise entrant into the playoffs. Now, they didn't make it further than the quarterfinals, but this is a group of blokes who can hold their heads high as they ran with the big dogs all the way to the playoff stage of the LATAM League final. They've done very, very well indeed. But now that things have settled, you can see that after this group stage, as we move and have a look at the bracket here, We've ended up with two teams that it really isn't too surprising to see in the grand final. Team one, ninjas in pajamas. Ollie, 
If I'd come to you at the beginning of the week and said, listen, these are the two teams we came to the grand final, I don't think your eyebrows, mate, they'd be staying right the way they were. They wouldn't be shooting up. Yeah, absolutely. Team one of that team that are capable. And, you know, maybe if, you, if you'd have posed that question a month or so ago, I would have maybe risen my eyebrows and said, are you sure that Liquid aren't going to make it there? But we know that Liquid have been struggling of late. And that's in part the reason that we got the game we've just seen. We've just seen NIP play Liquid. Uh, and the reason for that was Liquid's dodgy performance throughout the group stage. You can see there that they came in at third, which isn't really a position that we're used to seeing them in. Obviously, a very tough group, a very stacked out group to try and get out alive from. Um, but Team 1, they were the one that were able to make it out of the group, out of Group B. Um, it was a narrow run as well. I think there was a lot of people cheering for Phoenix in uh, in that early quarter final, just given that they are the Mexican team and have that representation at the mexican major would uh, would have been fantastic for them and i'm sure a dream for the players but they couldn't make it past that first hurdle uh, and alas we end up where we are team one versus nip well if you've just joined us you've come at a great time we are about to head into the semi or the grand the grand final i should say as you can see the uh, the clock ticking ever close to that let's remind ourselves of some of the stuff that we've seen already some of the action that has taken place in our semi-finals kicking off of course with team one Facing off against Fury. Now, Fury are a team that I know have a, a passionate and, and full throated support base around the world, but they fell short against Team One earlier on today. The performance put on by Team One just really suggests they're in good nick. They're in good touch. They've got their eyes in. They're ready to come and play ball, and they're ready to really show us what they're made of as this up and coming team in this region. Ollie, we've talked a lot about these guys already, and uh, during the semi finals, they look pretty confident. They really did. Team One put in a good performance inside of the semi-finals against fury the games were very clear cut or should i say the map at least maps number one and two uh mm -hmm. team one had a dominant victory on oregon and it was mainly off the back of alamau and his shotgun um he was able to do a lot of work he went 19 and 2 on oregon he quietened off throughout the course of the best of three but it really put team one in a good stead cafe a bit of a different story fury came back and showed us really what they're capable of there and then it was just a brawl on coastline, which honestly seems like a bit of a theme today. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've had all sorts of stanky action going on coastline throughout the last couple of weeks. In fact, we move now to have a look at our second semi-final, which, of course, took place between two titans of the BR6 League uh, in the form of Ninja's Pajamas versus Team Liquid. Gio, you've been watching these guys tumble and tussle for a long time as part of the Brazilian division here. And uh, they really put on a show, at least in, uh, in the first map before, NIP, they just, they found that second win. They they pulled ahead, they had more in the tank and ultimately have launched themselves into the grand final here, mate. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's a bit, this is probably the closest thing that you'd be able to say to maybe some kind of a grudge match from the SI mm -hmm. grand finals, just because it's not a best of one. This is at a, a more serious level event. And I think I would have loved to have seen Team Liquid put up more of a fight. But unfortunately, as you say, after the first map of Oregon, which went into OT, Team Liquid just didn't seem to have a ton of gas in the tank which is really a shame because when you consider the Team Liquid that we saw back in Stage 1 and that we saw at SI, it doesn't quite feel like they've been quite there as much in the last stage. Yes, indeed. Let's uh, move on now. We've got our Grand Final teams ready to go, as you can see here from these ones, uh, from these highlights. Of course, we've highlighted that uh, Team 1 has made their way to the Grand Final in addition to facing off against NIP. That's the second team. You can see them there, ready to go. Look at them, bloody hell, getting up and about. Let's have a look at where we'll be playing. A little bit of a, a different process here for the best of three map picks. If you're new to it, Ollie, let's have a chat about exactly what goes on with best of three map bands instead of just best of one. Yeah, of course, a little bit of a different format toward the best of one. It's going to be a bam, bam, pick, pick, ban, ban, decider. And we are going to find out where we are headed here. Chalet and Clubhouse first to be removed. Cafe going to be the pick there In. from NIP. Bit of Oregon again, sneaking its way on through. Oh, where are we going for the decide? It's going to be Coastline. Oh, where else? It's the, game. it's the Brawl map. Let's be honest. Or LCB, let's go. We've, we've seen all three maps in every game that we've seen today so far. This one certainly has that potential, especially if we cast our minds back the way that we saw Team One play on Oregon earlier. Interestingly, it's exactly the same maps. There's just a little bit of a different order here mm. outside of our first quarter final that Team One played Fury in. It's the it's the same maps. They played Oregon, they played Cafe, they played Coastline. So 
We'll have to see uh, how this one shakes down, but it's certainly ground that or uh, ground that uh, Team One is certainly familiar with at the moment. Yeah, we've been we, we've tread these boards before. Looks like we're ready to get into it straight away, right here, right now, my friends. It's great to have you company, and we are about to get into the first map of our grand final here we are back off to cafe it's not a map we've seen a lot in latam division coverage but we are getting stuck into it once again here the first match of the grand final is upon us take it away with the two casters here geo and ollie thank you very much riley it feels like i've been waiting a long time for you to give us that introduction geo we can finally get an in and amongst a little bit of siege here and bring everybody this grand final we've got nip we have got team one We've got a cafe as map one for our playground. Yeah, this is, you know, what is so interesting to me about that entire ban phase is it's like NIP focused on what they saw Team One show flaws in, whereas Team One focused on what they did really well. So it's these two different approaches you can go to picking and banning maps. So NIP have said, Team One, you had a pretty poor showing on cafe today. We're going to exploit that. And Team One are like, yeah, but we were really good at Oregon. We're going to yeah. go there. So I'm really interested to see how this is actually going to balance out when it comes to, you know, the outcome of these maps. Naturally, this map should, in theory, uh, benefit NIP more than Team One. But oh, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think this is going to be a? Do you think it's going to be a close one, or do you think this one's going to be a bit more of a, a slap? It's something that we didn't get to on the desk, um, and it's a point that really is worth bringing up, and that is that NIP have known who they were going to be playing in the grand finals. They knew it wasn't going to be Liquid. Do you know what I mean? They were playing yeah. inside of that game. It was either going to be Team 1 or nobody. So yeah. in terms of preparation that backroom staff can put in whilst that game is going on, whilst that initial best of three is going, whilst NIP are playing against Liquid, they know in the back of their mind all the time that they're going to be going to potentially play against Team 1 if they get through this one. So they can start to work and they can start to prepare. And we know that something that every team inside of the BR6 is very keen on is that counterpick strategy, is that little bit of a figuring out how they're doing something and we're going to do it a little bit better. We're going to bring that counter. And I think that that's what we're going to see now inside of this game. It's the same runner maps that Team 1 played earlier. And NIP have had a good few hours to go over and to figure some things out in terms of backroom. That then potentially been translated across in the hour break that we've had. And here we find ourselves with a Flores ban, a Mirror ban, a Maverick ban, and a Valkyrie ban, and a little bit of Cafe. Where you're right, Gio, we didn't see Team One play too well earlier. Very intrigued to see how uh, Team One are going to be going for this this setup on their kitchen defense because. It was something we've seen a number of teams here in Brazil do over the course of the last stage is when defending onto this site, they, they have a real messy uh, momentum and tempo in what space they're going to take, what space they're going to give up. We oftentimes see a lot of attackers these days completely forego trying to clear out VIP, even if they want to be attacking onto Freezer. And I think it's let a lot of uh, Brazilian teams down, and it almost looks like they've been trying to move into this new way of doing things that hadn't been fully figured out. So, as you say, Team One struggled quite a bit earlier on today, but NIP is still yet to really show us where they stand on those kinds of issues. Cafe is a notoriously defender-sided map as well. We saw that benefit go Fury early on in the quarterfinal, and it's a strength that NIP have been working and developing on over the course of the last couple of months is that prowess on attack, that killer instinct that they have developed and have really started to kick in with. So I'm not sure how I see these first couple of opening rounds go, but so far it's been a very tentative start. The drone will eventually gets spotted out there by Alamal, but it's already given quite a lot of information over, and Alamal getting tempted for a drop. Oh, that's a really good shot there on Neskin to clean him up, and that's uh, pretty much that control over by VIP taken that I said I was worried about whether they were going to focus on just because so many teams have struggled to. Well, really not a problem here for NIP. Psycho is nicely in there, and Kamikaze can watch the brown stairs too already quite methodical here from nip really is levy positions good inside 
of the bakery obviously is able to get his yokai drones out there and give a little bit of information neskin on the cameras he's been able to call out there for alamao and kamikaze will fall a little bit of a relocate now for the yokai drones as we're entering that pinch time and then ip for all that they've had a fairly measured start to this round now having lost the hard breach this last 35 seconds is going to be quite tricky for them they haven't got a clear route on in Lagonis is going to get tagged up and he's going to get knocked on down. The smoke lost at this stage isn't going to be ideal, but kills continue to trade. Pino now with an opportunity to get his way back on in. KDS still lying upstairs. Levy, a huge frag there over onto Pino, but again, instantly traded back. 15 seconds now for Muzi and Julio to make something happen. Alamau, he stepped up to the plate. He's picked himself up a triple and he's just going to try and keep himself alive. KDS finds the last. He's hanging out inside a dine and eventually is going to drop through the hatch and collect his last kill. Until the very end, every time somebody got a kill in that round, it was always answered. So none, there wasn't ever really the opportunity to be getting an advantage out of that. Um, and I think once Team 1 knew, of course, that the hard breach was down and there was no real way for NIP to be able to break into the site itself, they could start overstepping the defense that they were taking. That's why we saw Alamau and Levy coming out at the end because they knew they could punish NIP, especially as they were all separated by that point, right? Because if you've got enough of them dead they don't have trade potential um and i think uh, as much as i i didn't necessarily approve of lagonis's peak i thought it was unnecessary onto the main stairs ultimately it didn't really matter and nip couldn't do much to respond because of their lack of potential to break into the site well a successful round for team one is going to mean they need to switch things up now, this is a decision that I find kind of fascinating when, when, whenever we see teams go up to this top floor when other sites are available. And by other sites, I'm looking at you, Reed and Room Dining. I want you to be picked <laughs> as that second choice. The top floor can be so difficult to keep a hold of. It's very well understood by attacking teams and can regularly cause quite a few problems here. And for all that Cafe can favor the defense, if you... Go upstairs to this top floor a few too many times. Well, you might find yourself losing a few rounds. But not if they start like that. Levy, he's been able to pick off Psycho there in a great opening spawn peak. It's going to be Thatcher down. Just trying to think. I was going to say, oh, that could make it harder to uh, take control of the top floor after you were saying that it, it can be hard to hold on to it. But a lot of teams are very used to playing without a Thatcher. So even though things like those mute jammers will have to be removed, they'll still know how to do it without Thatcher being there. And actually with KDS backing off here to take control of Pixel, he's going to have to worry about the white window behind him. But... Uh, it basically means that Piano is still an option. That was a really nice kill on the way out. Pino just wasn't ready for it. This aggression that Team 1 are willing to bring here is really catching NIP off guard. And in direct contrast to the first round, we're not seeing anything come through as a trade here. And that's in part due, due to the fact that NIP are going at this sort of one-at-a-time approach. Now, albeit a spawn kill and somebody out on a repel is not an ideal recipe to be traded off. We're going to have to see a bit of a pinch and push come through now. The NIP, NIP have been heavily depleted here, and Team 1 have really got a lot going for the here. Muzi's made his way in. Levy can't quite land the shot. That's unfortunate. That gives Muzi the opportunity to cook a nade, send it in. He was eaten up by the ADS that was there for protection. Kamikaze taking a lot of damage as well. They're over the halfway mark. And while they're nicely in the building, they've still got to figure out their way through. It's going to be much harder as well to open up that backstore wall too because of the lack of the Thatcher and the electrification. With NIP down to just two players, this could actually be quite hard for them to make this push, Ollie. It really isn't going to be easy, and it looks as though it could be you know, Team 1 fairly quickly. Julio is going to be inside a site directly underneath the skylight, shaping up to be a flawless, and a flawless it will be. Neskin going to confirm the last with a nicely placed c4 there thrown in from the freezer julio taken out there he was in uh, a pretty tough spot one versus five never ideal and ip getting caught on the back foot pretty early on there inside of that round 
You know, one of the things that you and I were discussing before the start of the game was the fact that part of the reason NIP have just looked so indomitable recently is because their attack has been so strong. But part of the reason I think that makes NIP's attack so strong is the fact that a lot of people don't really know what to do to go up against it, um, especially if they have the power of friendship on their side. And what, what I mean by that is that usually you're going to have some kind of trade potential. They'll be very well coordinated with one another to make specific pushes. And I think the problem that they faced in these last two rounds so far is that because of, I mean, some of that early aggression, yeah, that Team One are willing to show, they can actually pick off those planned coordinated attacks that NIP are going to go for. So things like crossfires aren't available, things like coordinating utility that they would want to use especially early in the round aren't there anymore if they've got uh you know two attackers in a similar part of the map and they're trying to take control if one of them gets picked off the other one is instantly vulnerable and that's something we saw a lot of back in round one team one haven't really had to overstep too far and be mindlessly aggressive to do that they've just had to be unafraid of of peaking the positions that they know for sure nip are occupying yeah i think it comes down to when you rely on the team and the teamwork so much when you're then left in the clutch it can be quite difficult to pull it off if that was your specific plan from the start and with the advantages that we're seeing team one get in the early parts of these rounds it is causing quite a little bit of frustration i could imagine on the side of nip taking the time this time they're not uh, overzealously getting themselves up onto the roof one of the things that really slows attackers down here on this map is the fact that it can take a good 30, 40 seconds until you're effectively droning in that top floor in a position to move in off the back of the information that you're gathering. And even then, you've got a lot of things to try and wade through. And then I appear dealing very well with that time sink at the moment that just is cafe on the attack. It can be very unforgiving for these attackers, especially when you've got players like Levy underneath with a C4 ready to roll and windows prep in anticipation of a little bit of a jump out but finally we do get a couple of players in Moosey's going to be leading that charge to clear that top floor no one be picked off a window yet actually even though they did give some of their information away about being on a window but um you just didn't didn't get any immediate response from team one I do like the fact that they are specifically holding these positions on white stairs too and they've invested into the ADS. It's a really strong place to have and it's not that it's uncommon or rare but it's something that so far NIP haven't been able to break. The X Cairo's pellets also being jammed there. They do have Psycho to be able to deal with that but he's going to deal with Neskin first. There's a Toxic Babe canister as Alamal standing really close but Psycho was just quicker. I don't think Alamar was anticipating anything there. We've now got KDS who's joined in to try and land some shots. Land them he will, but if E2 will be traded, he's at least going to be downed here as Muzi and Kamikaze flood on through and pick up a couple of kills. Lagonis in a very precarious spot here. He's going to be in pillars, going for the shotgun, expecting somebody to jump over that balcony, but NIP have got a lot of time to play with here. Nearly 40 seconds on the clock. He's going to go for a swing, but Julio... Just nicely holding the cross all the way through into dining and well he doesn't really know his look when he sees the drone get shot out at his feet quick flick onto the doorway and ip they break the seal they find themselves around here on the attack and we go back to kitchen and kitchen kitchen squared uh i mean i'm actually really interested to see how nip are gonna do this because i thought that the early part of their approach and you know that it's not fair to say it like that their entire approach in in round number one i actually really quite liked it's just the fact that once we got into the mid round team one started to pick them apart um now this is interesting with alamal switching over to malusi off of goyo you know are they gonna have a bit more off-site play they had a little bit back on um round number one but they didn't have a ton and I don't know if I would anticipate there to be a full-on roam, but one thing that I do remember from round one is that NIP didn't have to go for a really thorough clear. They basically just set their sights immediately onto the bottom floor. Yeah, KDS was able to hide out inside a dine, and I think he maybe made that as a bit of a later rotation. It's uh, quite common to play with the freezer hatch open and, and to do that, especially if somebody like Habana is available uh, and you're not going to be bringing the Cade. 
it, it makes a lot of sense to, to play with that hatch open because it's something that's going to be get, got for free at some point anyway. And we can see that Freezer is going to be getting set up in a similar way here. I think from the side of NIP, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he switched things up here and maybe pressured Bakery a little bit more. It's somewhere that Levy has shown himself to really like playing in and well, with the way that the spawns are indicated at the moment it seems though there's a couple of players from nip over that side but in the meantime they're not going to be paying any attention there instead the top floor clear again will be the order of the day and the pressure instead then lands on the shoulders of alamau and uh, anybody else that's out up there on the roam uh, alamau was playing on uh, mozzie last time because he threw the c4 out really early Still holding on to his current one. He's going to get droned out eventually. Now, he he did drop pretty early last time as well. Uh, and not before being droned either. Oh, that drone just narrowly <laughs> didn't even see him. So he's going to take the opportunity to drop. His NIP is still up here on the top floor. It's a soft hold to the top floor, but it's giving NIP something to do here, though. Really having to get themselves invested here. Drone's going to be working ahead. Muzi very quickly taking this ground and going to start to try and hold onto these white stairs. Now the threat and the pressure is really coming on to that mid floor as already we can see the floor being opened upstairs inside a piano. That's going to give a bit of a line of sight down in toward Crane. Anybody that could be playing in between Crane and uh, Dining is uh, at the risk of being pressured. But for the most part, it seems as though a full retreat has been the order of the day from team one. You know, can't seem to get through that hole. All right, Neskin trying to hold an angle from below. Oh, he's actually used this C4. I was gonna say he'll have one in hand, but he does not in fact. So he, he's literally just got to wait with a weapon. KDS was actually, uh, I, was it KDS who was playing a VIP last time? I, don't think it was question mark no kds was playing upstairs last yeah time. i didn't think it was him well either way whoever it was who was playing in vip before got taken down very quickly all right i cursed it uh, psycho gets, gets kds down uh they don't have the entire uh, west side of the map however but that is an area that nip haven't been able to take as quickly as before plenty of information now being scrambled here by team one and it's gonna yield some serious results alamau and lagonis they're gonna find a couple of kills between them alamau maybe pushing him for another but no instead he's gonna get taken on down the brown stairs challenge coming in along with pino going pretty massive lagonis now from inside a coat check initially he's gonna miss his shots he has to draw for the shotgun here nip are being pinched there's levy and the threat of the yokai drone on one side and lagonis on the other and time above crushing down upon them team one they're going to clinch that one out by the clock uh, that's a kind of frustrating one as well because i feel like that could have gone nip's way um especially after pino got those two kills over in vip corridor because that was a really nice play as well from nip to be perfectly honest with you because alamal was kind of drawn into this um situation where he wanted to get the trade and was unaware that there was someone holding brown stairs as well as vip corridor and got caught out in the middle of it and because there was no one really to forcibly hold back nip from entering into the site i mean we saw lagonis was over in coat check he wasn't doing much and the yokai drone didn't get anywhere in time that could have been nip's round you know that uh, they just didn't do it fast enough and it's a shame because that's an NIP that we're, we're, we were seeing sort of six months ago. Um, you know, much slower NIP on the attack. And they kind of fell into that a little bit there inside of that round. But it's, uh, it still puts Team 1 in a pretty good position here. They've been able to pick up a good number of rounds and they've generated quite the lead for themselves. Now they've got to switch things up yet again. And they're going to be taking us back to that top floor site. It did work for them. Now there is that. But it relied on a really couple of well, a couple of early kills going in their favour. Most notably Spawn Peak onto Psycho. That was a really big part of the success that we saw previously when we saw this site. For the most part, it doesn't look as though that is being repeated, although Levy is gonna give it a go. Oh, just 
Oh, it's no. a chance, and Julio there with the heads up play. Julio must have seen a bit of debris or a little bit of glass there, just out of place from the window being open. It confidently swings on to Levy. And that's going to give NIP a little bit of a, an advantage, a bit of a swing of momentum in their favor here. And Psycho's just going to see KDS running away, try and get back to your action stations, because he knows he's not going to be able to get the kill on that window like Levy attempted. Again, Lagonis is on skylight duty. And NIP really struggled to attack onto this site back in round number two, and a lot of that was because they got picked off so early, leaving basically just two players to kind of push in on their own. That Oh, that was also really nice, just straight in through the line of sight. This is a different scenario to what we saw in round two because NIP, they got four of their players now and not really being held back as much by Team One. No, certainly not. Team One are playing uh, a very backed up defense now in toward this cocktail area. It's going to be something that they have to fight, you know, quite significantly long angles. KDS going to be on these white stairs as well as a nade comes in there from Pino. The second one might land. Our two ADSs up there. KDS doesn't look too concerned there about the threat of a nade coming in, but there's also the threat of a Muzi. As he's going to just be on the other side of that white corridor, pretty much outside a bathroom. KDS could go here for a little bit of a hop down. Maybe could get himself out and back through the reading room door. Still, it's a long rotation that he really doesn't want to have to make. Could also try and play vertically, but essentially is going to be pinched on. The, uh, on the white stairs for the time being as the upside down repel comes in from Pino and that's going to be a really big in here for NIP. Bit of a swing there going out from Lagonis but unable to land any significant damage. Alamal is going to fight back, finds one onto KDS but the trade comes through instantly. One versus three now for Alamal and 30 seconds for him to try and hold on. Going to hit the reload, he's got a bit of intel and he might be able to land a couple of shots here but no instead going to dip himself through. Getting closed in on now from every which way. Julio found the first, he'll find the last. NIP there, gonna pick up another round. It's almost like uh, NIP have realized that Team One are very happy to play at the windows, and so they are just making sure they're very prepared at the windows. That's kind of what it felt like, and maybe that's a little bit reductive because I, I don't feel as if that's something that they would only just realize, but maybe the extent to which, because in that round, I mean, Team One were really going for a lot of similar things that they were when when they played on that uh, site previously, and NIP just seemed way more switched on to deal with them before they became a problem for them. Um, and especially once you're out manning them, if you can control a lot of those windows and if you have a lot of that space through places like Piano or White Corridor or Cigar, or if you're pushing up in Bar, whatever it might be, over on, um, you know, beneath New Hatch, then uh, you can corner those players, just like we saw Alamau at the very end. So Team One have decided that they're going to be returning back there. This is the first time that they've done this, uh, returned to a site that they failed to win before. Um, I'm interested about this one, just to, to see what it is so fundamentally they're looking to change. Well, we've seen it go two ways. We've seen... Team 1 get the early pick, they win the round. NIP get the early pick, they win the round. So it's seemingly all on this opening pick. And the question is really sort of posed to Team 1 in that, are you going to go for it? Because if you don't go for it, you're not vulnerable to it. You can't be taken out through the brick and mortar that is cafe. You can only really be taken out if you're getting aggressive at the window. And at that point, you're arguably asking for it. So in the early part of the round, at least, it seems as though... Team 1 have gone, well, you know what, we don't want to roll the dice on that opening engagement being a bit bit of a spawn peak, a bit of out-of-the-building action. We just want to try and take something a little bit more guaranteed. And they've taken a bit more of a backseat approach toward this round. We've got KDS, he's going to be heavily entrenched there inside of the washroom and pixel. He's got a lot of different angles that he can try and work with. But of course, there is always the threat and the pressure of that white window. It's somewhere we've seen Pino more than happy to play with the nades. And already the drone's going to come in and push KDS off that position. Just going to be seeking some refuge. 
kind of silent for now. I suspect NIP are going to be doing a lot of droning here. Which they are very good at, and they've been using uh, their droning to get a lot of these early kills. Now, I think they are slightly expecting Levy to go for a run out here. He didn't even need a run out. He could just get Pino when he wasn't looking. So there you go. Opening kill goes to team one. Maybe maybe that means that it's going to be a 4-2 at the half volley. I mean, everything would suggest that. And an opening kill coming in in the, in the last half of the round is... Uh, Especially going into the defender favor, that's the attackers that have gotten a little bit sloppy there. It's been it's been forgotten about at that point, and Levy was pretty keen and pretty knowing in what he was doing there. I think that bottom white window was either prepped or had been shot out by the attackers just to give a bit of line of sight. But really gives NIP a lot of work to do here. They've lost a couple of nades, which were going to be very important. Julio, however, going to go for the hot drop, gets himself right on in and immediately taken down by Alamal. Now those smokes can start to move through Kamikaze. Removes the mute jammer. It's going to free him up to get onto his drone, but there isn't a great deal of time for him to do so. There's angles that have to be held here. With only three versus five, it isn't going to be too easy. Alamal gets himself down, so that's going to be a little win for NIP. At least they don't have any more smoke canisters to deal with. To be honest, Alamal got most of them out there when it really mattered. This push is coming through very flat now in through the freezer, but it's going to be led by Kamikaze and Psycho. Muzi picking up a frag as well. How has this gone so wrong here for Team 1? Psycho picks up the last one. NIP, what an execute there onto that top floor. I'll be honest, I think one of the really big things that gave NIP that win is the fact that there wasn't uh, the really heavy denial on the backstore wall like there had been before um now we didn't get to see so it was either that or it was that because psycho was alive he could use the emps we don't know which one it is but it's one or the other the point is is they got the backstore wall open which is something that they hadn't been able to actually do previously and not only did they get it open but they got open got it open in a way that they could move through it which gave them access to that center part of the map which I think everybody at this point basically knows is such a pivotal part of this map that it, regardless of which side you're on, if you have control over it, you're probably going to have control over the site. You're going to have control over the, the way that the round goes because it's so required to be able to move and make that commute through, um, through the building. I think something else looking toward that last round, and obviously there's the switch to the sides now. It looks as though we're going to hit a very quick re-host. Um, an equal 3-3 at the split as well, so a nice even share of the spoils there for both sides. I think we got a good reaction there in, in the replay that we saw just in between those two rounds from NIP and just exactly what that meant to them. And you got the impression that they'd solved a lot of problems inside of that round. I know you mentioned there, Gio, about getting that back door wall open. That was something that NIP were able to do successfully. It was Kamikaze that got himself into the washroom and actually found a position to shoot that out, that mute jammer, because it really was causing quite a couple of problems. But as soon as that happened and then a push could come through Freezer, Team 1 were a little bit too focused, I think, in playing into things like the Yokai drone and that denial. And when you're playing someone like Alamo and the smoke a little bit more aggressively and that gets taken out as an early pick, in the grand scheme of things inside of the execute it really is going to come back to her another point is we saw kds playing inside a pixel and washroom and it's his job to really command that area and we saw him drop off so early just off the back of a drone that was the pressure that was enough for kds to drop back onto the white stairs and he was the last player to die because he hung out on the white stairs for the majority of the round watching for a push in from that side and unable to have significant impact so I think from the side of NIP, they've done a really good job there in coming away with a 3-3 split. There's questions to be asked of Team 1 as to why they went up to that top floor as many rounds as they did. Um, because we, we found out there, Gio, it wasn't just all down to that opening pick. Yeah, and this is where it kind of get, becomes questioning because Team 1... Uh, have looked stronger on their defense than their attack in general over the course of uh, the event. Um, and now they're going to be heading in onto their attacking half, which, as we spoke about before, on top of 
this being a team one thing that as i just mentioned it's also a cafe dostoevsky uh, oh my goodness cafe dostoevsky thing where you would expect the defenders to probably have an easy time so ending the half on three three i'm gonna go out on a limb and say that's not what team one wanted that is probably uh a a bit of a letdown for them and they would have at least been looking for a 4-2 and i think will probably make it harder for them to have a really impactful attacking half now i hope for their sake that it is not as cut and dry as i just made it out to sound however uh, just judging by the the recent performance over the course of the playoffs and whatnot that's where i kind of start to wonder yeah, it's, it's a strange one, isn't it? Because we haven't seen the best from Team 1 on their attack. Um, and that's not to say that they're, they're a, not an attack inside. They're, a, they're an attack inside that's very capable. You know, you think about the roles that people are occupying. You've got Lagonis Harbridge, KDS entry, Alamal, a little bit of flex, Neskin sort of second entry along with KDS. They have those, those solid roles that you expect. Uh, and, and we know that everyone's very capable. But we just haven't seen the best from them inside of their attack. Uh, and this is maybe where they're going to get a little bit more pressured because, as we've spoke about it earlier, Cafe is uh, not an easy map to attack onto. We're going to get back into the game, though. We thank you for your patience during that short break. As, uh, I'm not sure what the exact falling was, but a rehost was required, and we have remade the lobby, ready to go back in for the second half. NIP now get the favour of that defensive side, and they maybe look to uh, stretch... That equal 3-3 three, three to uh, a little bit of something more advantageous for them. Mate, I'm going to say I love this. I love the Aruni Castle. When we talk about the fact that this site particularly just involves having a very strong push, you basically have to bulldoze your way across um, the map because you really only have to focus on one floor and you've just got to have a very clean push across that floor. I would say Aruni and Castle are two of the most obvious operators to think of when you think, hmm, who's going to make that push really difficult to do? Uh, it, it just demands so much of a utility sink from the attackers all the while, they've got to worry about everything else that is going on. And can you imagine if they lose one of the, uh, you know, the soft breaches early? You know, let's say Mo uh, Sorry, Moosey. It's because I saw Ash and I associate with Moosey. <laughs> let's say that they lose KDS really early. And even then, they're obviously only running one hard breacher. And we've seen what a struggle this site can be if you can't hard breach onto either the back store wall or of course you do sometimes have the option to do it on the second default spot behind the bar if you're just going to plant straight in the bar as opposed to go over to cocktail point is this could be quite a fragile attacking lineup if just the wrong person gets taken down too early it really couldn't you think toward burn utility as well you've only got the three stuns on the hibana sure there's a lot of other things that you can use psycho he's going to be playing fairly aggressively no stuns on the Hibana this time. Lagonis gets himself taken on out with it. it will likely be the diffuser dropped on the floor as well. And the soul hard breacher here for team one taken on out. Psycho so happy to oh, play aggressively what? here. Picks up one, finds two, a triple for Psycho. What a massive start to the defensive round here for NIP. There is a kill returned. Kamikaze will fall. But NIP are going to be very happy with that initial advantage. Jesus, and we were talking about a team one having a problem where they were backing off from piano too early. This feels like the complete opposite of that, where Psycho just, he got closer and closer up. And now we're back in that position that NIP had back in round number two, where there's just two players of team one left. They have to try and make their way over. The, the mini bar has been entirely shot out, so there's really no refuge there for Levy. Both of the last two players of Team 1 get taken down, and that was a fantastically dominant start for NIP on their defense. We didn't even really get to see the impact of the Castle Rooney. I'll be honest with you. When you get three players yeah. taken off on the repel like that, you could say, well, it slowed them down from getting in. They still had to get through Psycho, and they couldn't do that. A crazy start there for NIP, one that I'm sure they're going to be very happy with indeed. Back down now to Kitchen for the first time they go on the defence. As uh, Team 1, I'm sure they've maybe got the tail between the legs a little bit there. You very rarely see a display of skill like that. You very rarely see kills coming through from that stage inside of Piano. 
especially when you've got a player on either window. I mean, that's the that's the crime there that has been committed. There's a player on either window. There is a crossfire already there, and Psycho still ducks and dodges, bobs and weaves, and finds himself three. All right, well, this defensive lineup <laughs> is already just very interesting. Julio playing Clash is a lot of fun, and oftentimes you'll see a Clash uh, be really utilized a whole bakery. Now, when you look at the fact they have a Kaid, I suspect that naturally he's probably going to be used to hold Freezer. So both ends of this site are going to be pretty brutal to fight through, I think, for Team 1. Um, and then you've also just got to consider the Jaeger Rook projectiles are going to be really difficult to actually land and get a ton of value out of because of those two and, and obviously naturally you've got the anchor of, and the denial of the smoke so i mean this could be pretty hard uh, although just thinking that where is julio because it, it's psycho who's alone here in bakery oh you okay there we go he's going where i thought he'd go honestly i wouldn't be surprised at this point if psycho just fancies an acog and he's just going, you know what? I've just popped off in that be. last round. I just fancy a little bit, a little bit of zoom on my scope. And I'm just going to try and take a couple of these gunfights and be uh, be a little bit more chunky there with a couple of armor plates and stuff. But the push initially isn't going to be centered around that bakery. Instead, Team Warner going for the top down clear. It really is the only option here when attacking onto Kitchen. Got to try and attempt getting everything clear from the top down especially when there's the threat of, uh, of any sort of roam game but that's quickly going to be found out and then ip are just happy to waste that time in the early part of the round and then lean into their advantages and we all know what julio is capable of on any shield operator I mean, yeah, I personally think that that approach from Team 1 would probably be better because uh, I I reckon it would be... I feel like saying an easier time is, is quite a big thing to say, but you, in my opinion, you just kind of... You kind of got to forget that Julio exists. Yeah. I think it's probably the best way to go about it. And you can tell this is what Team 1 are going for. They want to open up a lot of the floor. Uh, that They're working over towards the hatch, clear out some of the utility from below to make it easier for them to move in. Of course, they've got to figure out how to get rid of that electro core. They could get Levy to do it, but I'm pretty sure... Uh, yeah, only one has been placed by Pino, so he has the opportunity to trick. Julio can just go out on a little bit of reconnaissance now as well and see what exactly has been opened up. Neskin's still going to be holding into Bakery. KDS joins as well. There's drones working ahead. Julio now moves through to try and assist. But Psycho's still playing behind Bakery counter. He does run the risk of getting naded on out. But there's likely going to be an ADS. It depends if that's been burnt yet or not. C4 going to fling on through. Doesn't deal any damage over onto Neskin. Psycho can retake his position now with a little bit more surety that he isn't going to get swung. But I say that Neskin comes in with a great headshot over onto Psycho. Now the pressure really is on Pino to start hitting his shots. He's going to be whiffing just a couple of them. Julio tries to come in and be the difference maker, but he's unable to land. Five seconds left. KDS is pushing on through. Pistol in hand. Kamikaze now. There's no time on the clock. He has to run away. He's forced out of the sight, and he does the right thing. NIP, they take that one on time. I almost think that's kind of jammy of um, Kamikaze at the end to just be like, right, if I just run out of their line of sight, I'm, we're going to win. <laughs> I could just run away. Uh, I mean, Team 1, I guess... The, the really difficult thing about the way that NIP were playing that um, defense was the fact that regardless of which direction Team 1 wanted to go for, it, if they did it quote-unquote properly, it was going to take a horrendous amount of time. It was going to take so much time. So they really had to go in for that kind of brute force method. And I totally commend the effort because it wasn't terrible. I mean, look at all these back and forth. You've got KDS with the pistol. It really wasn't that bad. But the problem is, is when you do try to go for the brute force, even if you can get through those first couple of people, you're probably going to lack information about what comes after that, um, which makes it very hard to keep walking into essentially a dark room. Um, so it's it's an attempt, and Team 1 certainly didn't do a terrible job of it, but I think that was kind of the entire point of the, the lineup that NIP brought, is you either force them into taking 
ages on an attack, or you forced them into doing something risky. Well, NIP are yet to lose a defensive round here, and as such, they've taken us into reading room and dining here for round number nine. Chance for them to get themselves onto a match point. Now, the, with how close the previous round was, Team 1 shouldn't be feeling too disheartened at this point, but they are approaching those must-win rounds where you really don't want to give NIP that opportunity to close this one out as a 7-3. That would be a little bit of a travesty, especially given how capable Team 1 are. are going to be going for the top-down approach yet again. It really is the order of the day on cafe it's one of the best approaches that you can make especially when you're going to be looking at reading room you need to get control of that cocktail area you need to get control of that top floor you can already see that nip are occupying that space they've got psycho playing a little bit aggressively and he will be taken out there by alamo who is dancing around the drones in vigil's cloak but eventually will be taken on out I mean, Alamal, when they were on the defense, was playing a lot around Skylight, so I'm not too surprised to see him doing the same thing on attack. And I, I was in the same boat as you, NIP, knowing full well that the top four was going to have to be taken control of. They decided to put people specifically up there. So a bit of an oversight there from Psycho, I think, who didn't necessarily consider that angle in the moment. It happens, it could be worse, and NIP haven't completely relinquished the top floor at all. No, you know, he's still going to be playing up there, isn't he? He's got a chance. In fact, yeah. he's going to take out Neskin. Yeah, I, mean, I was going to say, he has access to the long angle and the Alder. And of course, he's going to have the information from his own utility. Kamikaze getting aggressive. One onto KDS. Alamount to fall as well. Only two of these players from Team 1 left, and they're still on the top floor. He knows he's going to make his way back inside after his little jaunt out. As you say, two versus four. Regardless of the time left, it's tough situation to be in here and you can see that team one are pretty starved for info levy going to be checking every corner there as he moves through they've got a drone at each lagonis and levy so they've got something that they can try and base themselves off there are breaching charges in levy's back pocket as well but lagonis is instead going to go from drop and get himself into dining there that's maybe a bit of a risky one the vertical angles now that can be held. Oh, Levy, you are so, so desperately close. He doesn't even know. He's got no idea. He's going to have to jump in the drone and see if there's anything that he can find. Lagonis is trying to pressure on the same plane. There's live ping information coming in for Lagonis. He doesn't need much to take down Julio. Still the clock continuing to tick. Levy trying to make something happen on this vertical. A very big attempt here that Lagonis is going for. He takes the swing on to Muzi and he's going to deal a chip of damage instead gets himself embroiled in a pretty horrible gunfight. Levy, they're tempted for the drop. I think he got the glimpse as well as the shots are starting to come on through. Lagonis, how have you won that gunfight? Kamikaze and Pino, they're going to find the final two. It was a great attempt from Team 1. It was a fantastic attempt from Lagonis to get his way on through, but there was just so much for him to do there. NIP, they put themselves onto a map point. I mean, to be honest with you, Kamikaze and Pino really were the kings of the top floor because they got most of the kills up there as well. Uh, and then those final two. But um, as you kind of alluded to, those last two players of Team 1, you could tell how much information sharing there was going on between them. Um, you know, even when Lagonis was actually pressuring onto reading from the, the reading door over by Pillars, um, you know, he was obviously focused on Muzi, who was directly inside of reading, but he also caught a glimpse of uh, someone over in Laundry, which is when we then saw Levy go and spend attention onto the floor down into Laundry. So you could directly see where they were trying to coordinate those attacks. And, uh, you know, as we saw before, um, um, Levy not necessarily knowing where those players were through the floor, so having to get on the drone, give Lagonis information. So even though that didn't work for Team 1, I think being able to see the cogs go round while they were doing it is, is pretty cool. And they were just in a situation that was slightly too monolithic for them to scale. Yeah, it really was, and they've done a great job. They had two drones going into that. That were that were live for them to sort of use. So they, they've managed to make a, a real a real meal of what they had available for them. 
Um, but again, just not quite enough. And NIP getting that advantage in the early round. I mean, they didn't even get first blood there. They were just able to come away with a lot of those scrappy engagements on that top floor. But still, they sit now on a match point. And again, we're waiting to see what Team 1 are going to be able to show us here in their attacks. It's an aspect that they've struggled in quite a lot. And this round was no different. We saw this round play out earlier on. NIP are returning here. Psycho was able to have a pretty fun time, I'd say, inside of Piano. He was able to get himself three kills on the windows, playing very aggressively. And we're seeing a similar setup here. And now we've got this castle and we've got this Aruni set up. The bulletproof cameras that are going to provide plenty of information for them to be going off. But a nice early nade. Pino is going to get himself caught on out. I don't think he's going to be finished off, but he is in a bit of a tricky place to try and revive. It's quite, that's quite difficult, but uh, I mean, Psycho landing a kill on Dolagonis is sort of gets revenge before it's even needed. And the nade to go in, it, Levy should be able to pretty freely pick up the diffuser here. And I'm assuming that he cleared some utility, whether it be a shield or, or whatnot. Um, with that nade before he went and did that. Now, this was the angle before that we saw get so much for Psycho because of the direct height of that line of sight. But, I mean, Kamikaze's going to be caught in the line of sight himself. Some of these kills that are coming through are a little bit weird, honestly. Kamikaze <laughs> there just seemingly inside of shop, allowing Team 1 to walk up on him. Muzi getting a little bit of a one-tap over onto Neskin as well. Still... An advantage for NIP for the time being. Pino flies himself out the window again. Julio backing him up. Levy, the last man standing. It's going to be a two versus one, essentially, for the time being. 1v1, but Julio wins those. Picks up the kill from inside of back storage. That's going to be NIP taking map number one here inside of our grand finals. Not a single plant made in that entire map. This was definitely a war of the guns. And we had a lot of great gunfights uh, in this map, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. But NIP did look incredibly impressive with a lot of what they brought out. And to me especially, that was true on the defense, just when you consider how well thought out a lot of their defensive strategies seem to be now naturally with this being nip's map you would have assumed that it was going to go better for them and uh i suppose for team one when you consider the fact that they've now just had two relatively big losses on cafe dostoevsky it's probably going to be something that they want to be looking at in the future yeah it's uh, certainly not ideal for team one uh, we're going to jump back in and we're going to bring Riley into the picture as, uh, as we don't mess around getting him back on in. Mate, Rook, what a hero. <laughs> what an operator. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm newer to Rainbow Six Siege. I played it for a little bit, but, you know, just, just mucking around casually with my mates. Getting into it professionally, uh, you know, as, as a caster, as, as a host. I just don't know why more people don't play Rook, man. <laughs> what an operator, dude. Do you know I like playing Rook? I'll tell you. I'm terrible at the game. But you just can't stuff up Rook's gadget. It's so hard. To, I mean, I managed to. Sometimes I'll go into the game like, you know, my mate, Stabby, his name is Stabby. He's like, you forgot to put the bag down. I did forget to put the bag down. Why don't we see more Rook in competitive <laughs> Siege, man? What do we have to do to make Rook playable, man? I just want to see Rook. I mean, I think the thing with Rook is like he's quite a niche operator. So he's one of those operators that in, in a lot of cases, it's not that he's bad per se. It's that there's always someone who uh, fits a is more general and will always mm. find use whereas rook i think you have to bring in on very specific strategies so ollie and i kind of had our, our own uh, hypotheses about why rook was bought because i said oh you know uh, it, it's gonna help uh, mitigate some of the damage coming from the projectiles and ollie was like nah it's the acog which is a perfectly <laughs> viable reason to bring rook by the way and would not be the first time Ah oh, man red dot just red dot. Red dot rock every time. Because then you can see where it's going to shoot. It's so much easier. I don't, know, I don't know why people don't use red dots more often. It's so easy. You should be a coach, mate. I tell you what, mate. Put me behind these teams. I'll, tell, I'll be getting the Ws in there. Don't even worry about it. Anyway, we did see NIP get up and about there. And look, it's not too much of a surprise. We know they're the superior team in terms of record, in terms of history, in terms of composition. But oh, look, Team 1, they gave a good account of themselves. They're going to have to dig deep. They're going to have to uh, find uh, something here as they can test there. Now... We're moving on to their map now, I understand. So maybe they'll have something special for us. We're going to find out. We're going to have a quick break here, get things set up for map number two. Don't go anywhere. Will NIP be able to seize the grand final or will Team One claw their way back into this? We're going to find out after this. 
Esta chica quiere selfie, selfie, ella quiere ver Pa' que el CV se dé cuenta que aquí perdió esa mujer Lo que quiere es enloquecer, ser la mujer que él quería ver Esa chica quiere selfie, selfie, que yo parezca en él Como que ella quiere Disfruta la noche, lo anormal Creo que el novio teme Que su relación va a terminar Se da cuenta que no Necesita alguien más Quiere un selfie para su Instagram Ella ya no quiere relación Alguien que diga su condición Que solamente le dé traición Va después llegar con un perdón NIP poised here to seize the LATAM League final championship. Their opponents, Team 1, our second and potentially last fi grand final map, begins now with your casters, Gio and Ollie. Thank you very much, Riley. We are going to be headed on into Oregon now. We do have NIP sitting at a one map advantage inside of this best of three to decide who is the best team inside of LATAM. Team one, they have to stand up and be counted here on Oregon. And honestly, I don't think there's a better map for team one to do that on. We were having a bit of a chat there inside of the break. And NIP haven't played Oregon a great deal at all. It is almost, well, I think it is their permanently banned map. It is the map they ban the most. So there's a chance that we're going to see something a little bit new here. And I mean, what does that say about NIP when there's a major in a couple of weeks, Gio? <laughs> they're willing to bring out a map they've banned out for an entire stage here in the Copa Elite Six Finals. Mate, they just want to make their mark. They just want to get the nail in the coffin. And they then just want to win everything. On. I am definitely, definitely interested to see what it is that NIP have planned, though. Now, they're going to be starting on their defense, but one of the things that we did talk about was they always had this same freezer push approach like every time they attacked onto oregon back in stage one and then we just obviously haven't seen any of it in stage two because they've decided not to touch the map so i'm expecting a very different style of oregon play however as i say they are starting on defense so we're gonna have to wait to see how their attack is um just to mention the operator bands as we didn't really go over them but i think nip choosing to bang ying is particularly uh, <laughs> it's a bit mean because we've seen a lot of teams, including Team 1, who, who do, of course, like to use that to facilitate a push down the meeting hatch. Um, and to get rid of that, like, it's just a... It's not, it's, it's, it's not a direct target ban, but it's not not a target ban. It's something that we saw uh, Team 1 doing earlier on in the evening. We saw them play a little bit of Ying against Furia. We saw Alamau bringing out those Candelas. It was something that uh, Team One were able to take a, a bit a bit of advantage of is those uh, sort of scrappy gunfights that you can ensue once everybody in the site is blinded and you can move on through and uh, really make something happen. So, NIP definitely doing their homework here for this one and starting out on the defense here. I'm not exactly sure how they've managed to uh, how they managed to work that one around, but it's going to be the favored side, of course, here on Oregon. And Team 1 are going to have to uh, dig deep from the start, really, to uh, be able to get themselves back into this one. It was quite a convincing win for NIP on Cafe. And this could very quickly be a 2-0 grand final said and done. But Team 1, they, uh, they've they got to say something about it, and I'm sure they're going to start pretty soon. Well, I would assume that given that Team 1 picked this map, they've they've got something planned, something up their sleeves. This is, you know, 
a basement defense, I'd like to point out, even though that there's a lot of presence up here on the roof, as you can tell that Team 1 want to be going in for, I suppose, a decently thorough clear. And we've got a couple of members of NIP who are down on the first floor, Psycho being one of them, and he's going to immediately make a dra uh, drop alongside Pino. So now everybody's down in the basement, and Team 1 have had basically half of their round taken away from them, and no kills gained for it. No kills gained and no significant map pressure either. The big sort of danger here for Team 1 is that they have played quite a bit of Oregon and we know how Team 1 likes to play this map. On the side of NIP, we've just not seen it for such a long time that we're going to be expecting to see newer things come out here, things that we've not seen them do before. And that really does start to uh, get a little bit scary, especially when you look toward the site and you see these laser gate placements and you think, you know, they're really going to start slowing people down, especially when we're already inside of the final minute. Sending the Geminis down through Freezer, which, I mean, again, cool, you're getting some good information, but there still hasn't been any significant pressure, and there doesn't seem to be anywhere else either. So, Boozy, for example, who's over an elbow sitting behind a shield, is pretty much untouched right now. Now, they want to get rid of these Aruni gates, that's what the lifeline's doing here. The Gonis might be about to pressure Muzi. So they will have this multi-pronged approach and KDS opening things up onto Psycho, but Pino is ready for those coming down through Freezer. Neskin now the next into the breach inside of that Freezer. Alamar's actually going to be prone, finds himself a triple kill. Kamikaze again trying to hold on. Going to be a quad for Alamar. Honestly, sometimes I just don't know how he does it. How does he get away with those sort of engagements? Four kills seemingly out of nowhere just cruel <laughs> honestly that did seem to be i don't i'm not even sure where alamal came in from did he come in through meeting hatch or did he come down the stairs because... I'm, I'm gonna guess meeting hatch just just because i know it's gonna annoy you well <laughs> no <laughs> because it actually worked but what i was going to say is nip didn't have a really significant presence up on the north side they had uh, it was all kind of centralized. I think a lot of their positioning, and then as I say, Muzi was all the way out in in blue and elbow. But I can actually totally see how Alamal would have been able to freely make his way into supply like that because there wasn't anybody directly watching it. And then if he's gonna if he's gonna crawl along the ground, <laughs> it's like the snake game. Yeah. The whole, you got to see, start the round on your belly, you end the round on your belly. You just got to prone all the way on through. Um, I mean, jokes aside, Alamal has done, done great work there to, to come away with the round, especially when we're sort of talking about how much time was wasted by NIP and what their sort of setup was looking like. It, it was very time wasty. It was very utility sinky. Um, you know, you've got to get through a lot of those laser gates before you can start pressuring shields or players in power positions. So for Alamal to burst through and find himself four is uh, certainly impressive indeed it's i think it might just be something about this map because this was the map that alamau at 19 and 2 on earlier on today so i don't know what it is about alamau and oregon but he always seems to have a stormer well i mean the the challenge is on for him to beat that right psycho pushing up kind of aggressively up towards uh green now he keeps there have been a few rounds where he's been taken out what? really early. Just uh, stop. And Alamal, you too, stop. Psycho's had one good round, right? And that's that's cruel. That isn't true. But for, for the sake of the statement, he's had one great round inside a cafe where he got three kills on the windows. And then since then, he's tried to play in this aggressive nature. He's tried to Overzealous. get himself out there. And just... Who goes on that long of a run out in this day and age with the outside detection being instant? <laughs> it's just not something that you see. Alamau hits him with the turn and burn. Sure, he's on one health. But again, it's a nice opening advantage here. And that honestly, the dangerous thing here is we've got Alamau on the book. That is just something that we don't get to see all too much of. But it is a very dangerous prospect. He's got himself straight on in. He's gathered a bit of intel. But that's really all it is ever oh. going to be. The Gonis takes him down, but he was already dbn would Julio now trying to pressure up onto this window. Kamikaze finds one onto Lagonis. Team 1 have really rushed this. And they've got themselves into a 2 versus 2 despite that early advances. Julio's going to find one inside of the attic as well. Neskin cooking a nade, getting it on in, but it isn't going to deal any damage. He's announced himself now and he's going to go for a bit of a deeper nade. 
but that's not where Julio is hiding. Julio has a bit of information here as we see yellow pings coming on through. Neskin now going to make his way up the yellow stairs, but the Toxic Babe canister is going to cut him off. The barbed wire has been removed, but again, everybody knows where he's coming from here. Now, he's got a minute to play with. He's got plenty of time. And with the way that these canisters are being spaced out, Kamikaze isn't going to be able to hold that off forever. The last canister comes on through, and there's still 50 seconds yet to play here. Neskin just going to be biding his time. The diffuse is cold. We can forget about that at this point. This round really is going to come down to kills and kills alone. And they should be kills that NIP are getting. Kamikaze going to throw out a couple of cursory shots. Julio just misses his chance. Neskin has now made it to the top. And he's going to look to try and push on in aggressively. Oh, I thought he was going to find Julio there. But Julio hits his shot. How many times have we seen this guy clutch up so far tonight? The Roni there doing the business at the close range. Yeah, I mean, as you say, um, Team 1, they had the early advantage in that round, but what they didn't do was any kind of structured attack onto the site. So we didn't see a particular emphasis on, you know, opening up with hard breach and coming in through games and attic and, and whatever. Um, there was, you know, Alamau just jumping in through big window, and maybe it was an attempt at bait and he was just trying to be a bit of a martyr, but... It just kind of led to a little bit of dysfunction and chaos, which I think didn't help Team 1 in that instance because it separated them all out. Um, and you have this centralized team of, of uh, NIP who have lost one guy, but otherwise mostly together, and they can just pick you apart as you start to come in and it leaves you all distant from each other and not really able to perform anything with much force when you're in that kind of situation. So if NIP do go back to Kid Storms in the future, I would like to see Team 1 just going for a more standard style of attack onto that, uh, rather than kind of allowing themselves to get picked apart. One round of peace here for both of these teams. NIP back downstairs, they go. As this was a round that, again, was won off the back of Alamau and what he was able to do in a pinch. We see the setup coming through. Not quite the same as last time. NIP have dropped the Aruni. I mean, Oli, th there's no shields. There's no barbed wire. Ooh, that, I, that was a nice run out. Talk, talk to me about your shields and your barbed wire when Pino can run out and find one. To be fair to yeah. him, it is Pino this time. It wasn't Psycho. Uh, the Valkyrie he's, being he's available is something that Pino's happy to try and work with. We're seeing that aggression pay off there when previously it hasn't. It's just such a dice roll, honestly, to try and get aggressive like that in the early mm -hmm. part of the round. And, you know, we know that NIP are that team that like to send a bit of a message, but Team 1 are willing to hang at those sort of levels, I think. I don't think it's even just that. I think NIP know that if they can get that early pick, then it can send Team 1 into a bit of a frenzy and kind of throw them off their balance. So for NIP, I'm wondering if maybe they just see it as a risk that's worth taking because the payoff is actually quite good. Uh, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. It worked for them in this round. Um, but again, you know, with the, the utility stuff I was mentioning, now you have this kind of position where Julio's at the bottom. He doesn't have anything to protect him. But again, with Psycho standing where he is, unexpected team one hadn't droned him out does it matter it's like the roles have been reversed here a little bit i feel like team one are maybe a little bit too far ahead of themselves and there's still defenders behind them that are going to come through to try and pinch Neskin's still searching for players inside of kitchen and will be taken down by pino pino gets a chance at a second as well but eventually will be traded alamo moving very quickly there from the back stairs into the meeting to be able to get something done as they look to push down Laundry now. Lagonis establishing himself inside of this freezer. A pop flash going to go out, but it's going to give the game away. Team 1 are going to have to go for this two-pronged approach here. They're going to be two versus four. Four versus one now as Alamau is going to be the last player standing. Muzi gets a great shot over onto Lagonis. Look at NIP stacking up here for that final kill. Kamikaze going to be leading the charge there, but it could have been any single one of them. A very aggressive round there from NIP. Yep, and, and that was a round where it paid off. And I honestly do think that they just have that effect on Team 1, where if they can get that opening aggression onto them, then cool, they're kind of playing into their hands. So NIP have now taken both of their 
first two favored rounds because they wanted to go back to laundry and ensure that they could get that one and they didn't really look too troubled in doing so if i'm totally honest with you ollie so as they head now to their tertiary site of uh meeting see what it is they're going to be doing psycho did bring um valkyrie before oh, actually i don't know if it was psycho but i know that they brought a valkyrie before because we saw the black eyes be thrown outside and that seemed to have really helped facilitate them in a lot of that early aggression that they were doing so i'm curious to see if that's going to be a pattern that emerges through the way that nip have their defense uh, and i suspect there's going to be a lot of off-site play here again when you just have a look at the operators that are being brought it really leans into that idea of there being a roam which is something that uh, team one there i i just yeah i guess i mean their time management just hasn't been perfect when trying to deal with them Yeah, it certainly hasn't been ideal from Team 1 up until this point. It's very difficult when you're going up against a team like NIP that are willing to play this very aggressive game where you sort of sat there wondering how many outside Valkyrie cameras are there? Are we about to be run out on here? Do we need to rush our approach into the building or into some sort of safety? The bonus and Levy taking precautions here as they don't want to get taken out too early. Neskin going to be trying to gather that intel as well on the Gemini clones. Meeting can be a tough site to crack, and Pino's going to make it a little bit more difficult. Removes Alamal, removes the Thatcher it's himself back upstairs. You just know that that's a kill that's been got from inside to out, and again, it's going to be something that slows down Team 1. Uzi's just trying to get that perfect little thread needle angle onto the stairs. So far... Won't be seeing anyone, but they might be able to catch out a couple of these drones. Neskin to be DBNO'd at the bottom of the tower stairs and finally finished off by Julia, who goes for KDS as well. Once again, NIP are looking fully healthy as Team 1 continue to fall, but finally, one from NIP does as well. Well, with Kamikaze down, it isn't going to make things that easier, but it at least alleviates the smokes and the... Toxic Babe canisters could be knocking around. Muzi is going to find himself one before being traded. Lagoris is trying his damnedest, but he can't land his shots. Pino going to fly in and pick up that last kill. Able to trade off his teammate. He honestly he didn't know where he was. He was just pre-firing every angle that he could conceive. I mean, yeah, Team 1 just didn't even really get the opportunity to actually break into the site itself at all in that round. They really struggled with it, so... I don't know, maybe they'll have an easier time now that they're heading back upstairs to a, I suppose, a more comfortable site. But again, this is where I said that I wanted to see Team 1 going for a more standard style attack onto the top floor. Now, part of me is like, I wonder if maybe they're a bit hurt from the fact that they don't have the Ying, but I don't think that a Ying ban should be hurting you this much, so I don't really want to rely on that. They got the six pick onto Jackal, which I think should help, because I think there have been a couple of times where players from NIP had been in places that Team 1 didn't necessarily anticipate. It does certainly seem to me like Team 1's droning on Cafe was better than it's, it is here on Oregon, and I, I don't know if you would agree with that, Ollie, but it feels that way. Yeah, I think so. I think Team 1 are playing in a a very weird play style moment. It looks like they're trying to speed run through, and I'm not too sure why that is because we, we've seen them play Oregon and we've seen them play a good Oregon. Um, and just with the way that we're seeing sort of Alamal flex onto this operator and that, that there isn't a lot of consistency in what they're bringing here. No, not at all, really. I guess we'll see how this one goes. I, I, I do hope that this Jackal is going to give Team 1 a bit of a boost, uh, especially if they can catch out one, maybe even two players of NIP off the back of it. I think two is maybe a bit uh, ambitious, but there has been such a fight for the opening kill. Alamal, I suppose, is looking to come up from behind and catch any rumors who may be playing on a, a floor that is below the top one. Only one of the black eyes got deleted as well, which is going to really help. And that actually is part of the reason, I think, why Pino is going to be heading back upstairs because he doesn't have that information on his side anymore. Probably wasn't Pino's greatest ever Valkyrie camera, I'll be honest. <laughs> just uh, sort of plonked on the side of the white van. It, it, was, it was chilling, <laughs> you know, it, it was there. There was an attempt. Um, but, I mean, there's so many places to hide him here in Oregon and 
Everyone knows that it only takes one slight movement of the mouse and the camera doesn't quite go where you've envisioned. Especially when you're trying not to get yourself taken out as you're getting them on out there. But he's still got one in pocket and there's still a bit of information to gather. That one will get thrown on out as Alamar moves through, trying to find some footsteps on the Inox. See if there's anybody that you can root out here. Again, a bit of a different approach. Previously, when we saw this site played, we saw Almar playing on the book. Here, he's playing on the Jackal. And here, Psycho is finding more opening kills. Hiding out inside of that small tower area. Somewhere that we've seen a lot of success from NIP. No. Almar, how do you lose that fight? Julio, he picks himself up too. Pino, he's going to double down. Very quickly, Levy, he's left in the pinch. He's one versus five. Finds the first. Can he move on through? Everybody now on the side of NIP knows where he is. The hatch is open. He could look to drop. Instead, he's going to look and find a kill through it. But Kamikaze is there with the swing. I'll tell you what, for an anchor, he certainly gets himself amongst the frags when NIP have got a man advantage. He's there after thirsting after that final kill every single time. Padding those stats. 4-1 here for NIP. They're running away with Oregon and the series at this point. That was just... It it was really frustrating as well because you could tell that the jackal was working. So you knew they were tr correctly tracking. They knew where these players from NIP were, but that doesn't mean anything if you can't actually land the shot onto them. Uh, so a round that very much could have gone in Team One's favor because of that adaptation that they made was cruelly taken away from them just because a, a bit of a mess up there. And I, I totally applaud Lev... Uh, yeah, it was Levy at the end, right? I totally applaud him for the attempt that he made on the um, the last few players remaining of NIP because those were two really nice kills that he landed. But if they're going to rush you at the end, there's only so much you can do. So unfortunate for Team 1, who now just have one more opportunity to finish this half at a 4-2. Otherwise, they're going to be having a pretty tough time going into the next half here on Oregon. It's going to be once again down in Laundry, and this will be the third time that they visited it. Uh, and NIP were being very aggressive last time they defended here. I mean, aggression has been the order of the day for NIP. That's really what they've brought here against Team 1 in, in Cafe and here on Oregon. And it's... Uh, it's been quite eye-opening, really, to see NIP play in this a little bit looser and a little bit freer of a play style where they can just play these aggressive operators. They're playing onto the Valkyrie, they're playing onto the Vigil, and they're looking to really take these early engagements. Already we've got Psycho. He's going to dip back, but initially he's stopped Alamal from pushing on through. He's denied the drone, and now he can look to team up with Julio and deal with an approach that's coming through the tower side going to be a bit of intel available as well that kitchen such a powerful area to rotate through psycho now able to set his sights on making sure that julio is going to be safe as again they're not giving anything away for free here i mean yeah none of the attackers are over here towards kitchen right now so while they're they're occupying a lot of space our nip um i don't think they're going to find Many kills downstairs. You know, throwing out a C4, but I'm not sure where he was getting the information from because he's not going to find anybody. Instead, he'll just jump down and uh, I suppose get ready here on the freezer stairs, which is where Team 1 have liked doing their pushes from. So it makes a lot of sense to want to have that kind of fortification. The Team 1 have been taking their time upstairs still, and while they're droning down now... Oh, they're just above the hatch. While they're droning down now... Let's see how much Pino can do on his own. Well, Psycho and Julio certainly can do quite a bit between themselves. KDS and Lagonis now as the last two alive. There's a bit of a recurring theme here with Lagonis being left in the clutch. He could choose to push himself down laundry or join up with KDS. Neither option looks great. If we're being honest with ourselves, a two versus five with 45 seconds. It's not an ideal situation. That camera is still going to be up. And it's again information that can be gathered. But with the hatch being open, you're going to be able to put two and two together there as NIP. And understand that this is going to come through this back side of the bunker push. 
coupled with potentially a meeting hatch drop. KDS going to deploy his utility through, see if he can get anybody stunned on out there. Lagonis has a line of sight to work with and an opportunity to take down Kamikaze, which he will take. Julio now going to join in on the action. Goes out for the C4, but isn't able to make it land. KDS, a big entry, finds himself two. Lagonis, a third. This is very doable now. Pino. He's going to be in the clutch. He's got four seconds to try and hold on. Lagonis, he has the kit and he's going to be thirsting after this kill. The pre-fire comes through. Neither player land the shots. It's going to go out on time to NIP. Oh, my God. Did you hear me, like, gasp and hold my breath? <laughs> Honestly, what a round. I, I didn't know who to expect because I was like, oh, he's making a lot of noise by running. And the position that Pino had was a pretty strong one, but it actually looked like it was known. So for it to end like that, wow, I was, <laughs> I felt my blood pressure go up for a, for a little bit then. Um, I mean, it was actually a really nice attempt by Team 1 at the end as they started coming in through the north side. Those were some great kills that were taken by them to shift the momentum and the advantage in such, such a short space of time was actually incredibly impressive. The fact that it came down to that final kill not quite landing that's really frustrating and very unfortunate and you know now team one have their opportunity to be going into their defense now one thing that i've noticed here ollie that i think you're going to be quite happy about is they're bringing in ella well where have we seen this before it's going to be lagonis <laughs> that is going to be playing on the ella typically it's something that we saw uh we saw alamal occupy Mm. Ella and particularly Ella's shotgun. That really is the, the secret source here for this site, as there are so many close angles that you can try and hold on to. Um, it often makes a lot of sense to bring something like the FO12 just because of its fast fire rate. And you can really command anywhere inside of bunker if you're going to try and hold elbow. Or, of course, you can control the rear stage stairs as well. And the Grismot Mines, nice little early warning system to pop on out there. Um, well, maybe the secret source is going to work for them and actually start putting some more rounds on the board because if, they, if they're not careful, they're about He's to lose He's not even this. got the shotgun. Oh, it's all right. Let's... No, it's, it's not the it's not the secret sauce all right it's the less secret sauce but it's still a, <laughs> it's like a high-end supermarket sauce okay okay what flavor right. like bolognese bolognese it's not very polish is it um i, d I don't know what sauce is the polish no thing. idea anyway um what I was going to say is if Team 1 don't actually start to turn around this corner now, NIP, uh, NIP need just two more rounds to win the entire grand finals here. And they've got the opening kill and we, we've seen how this has been going, Ollie. Yeah, we've seen this movie before and it ends in NIP usually winning the round. Now, they are dealing with a bit of a different site here. They're dealing with Basement on Oregon. It isn't the easiest site to attack onto. Especially when you've got players like Alamout on the shotgun playing quite aggressively inside of the freezer. If that position is maintained, it could be quite tricky to root on out. But alas, he dips himself on out. Everybody's scurrying on the side of Team 1 as they don't want to get themselves embroiled in these early engagements. Especially after already losing Levy and a lot of those Whamai discs, those magnets they were relying on to try and catch a couple of these projectiles. A kill will be found in return. Lagonis. He's going to see some success. Takes down Psycho and a good number of drones as an IP look to try and manifest themselves in this freezer push again, Geo. Gonis is the one who's watching out on freezer duty. When NIP have done this freezer push in the past, it has oftentimes been literally all five of them. Now, all five of them are not to hand right now. Psycho from the grave is wishing them luck. But uh, in... I would like to see that not be the case here. And they've worked on opening up the meeting hatch. So I'm I'm going to be looking for this kind of two-pronged attack. And you can see the way they're stacking up here on Laundry. Suggest that's what they're going for, uh, which is going to give them some more dimension if they do do that and the opportunity to set up some crossfires, which they always lacked when they just tried to brute force their way in through Freezer. Team 1 going to be pretty happy with the time at the moment. Alamal going to send out his last Toxic Babe canister. As they've only got to hold on for another couple of seconds. Push still trying to make its way through into Freezer, but it's greeted with a deployable shield. Alamal with a swing finds Muzi. 
That's going to open up the kills inside of this execute. Will be instantly traded, though. An unfortunate team kill on the side of NIP, but it isn't going to stop Julio from pushing on through. The C4 goes out. It isn't going to be successful as Neskin finds Pino. Another kill comes in onto Julio as he was for a time attempting to get that plant down. It would have been the first that we've seen of the night. We thought better of it. Needed instead to take the gunfights. The time was running out there and Team 1 find a round they desperately needed. Oh yeah, they're keeping themselves alive just a bit. They've still got some work to do uh, if they're going to make this a long-term thing. But that was the, the first step of a, a longer journey. And now they can move upstairs to greener pastures. Now, this is an interesting one, actually, because I want to see if this clash is going to stay. There we go. Immediately, I was like, the fact that NIP have decided to bring a Capitao, if they stick on the clash, that is such a big counter to the clash that it is basically useless to bring her. Um, so uh, pretty unsurprising that Lagonis there has actually decided to switch over onto Echo instead of staying on clash. Um, because I think that they would have been in for a world of hurt had that been the case. I feel like it was a nice nod to either team as well, because we saw NIP initially pick the book. Obviously, Alamal's known for playing the book. We saw Team 1 initially <laughs> pick the clash. Julio's known for playing the clash. So it was a kind of a nice nod to either side, like, yep, you know, we, we ain't going to play these guys. Like, we're just baiting you out yeah, here. But yeah, we, we see you and we respect it. Um, it, it might be a bit of a... A bit of an edge there that Team 1 can try and introduce here. I'm a little bit more surprised that they're not bringing out the Valkyrie. I'll be honest with you. Because with Valkyrie being available and how much we saw NIP take advantage of it. If you're going to bring anybody for information. Surely the Valkyrie's got to be top on your hit list. You would assume so, wouldn't you? Especially when you consider that um, Psycho was playing Valkyrie so very effectively earlier. But... The thing is, NIP were using that really to enable a lot of runouts. That's not been something that Team 1 have lent into quite so much, but I think their um, Echo is something that they've looked at playing a number of times, and I guess they're more interested in the late round denial. Um, and I guess the double shields, maybe? Does Valkyrie even still have a shield? <laughs> No, Valka's impacts in C4. She had so many changes a while yeah. ago, and I struggled to keep up with everything. But yeah, so um, having the two shields is going to be a big benefit. Especially when you lose Pino early on. That's a couple of nades. The only couple of nades that NIP were trying to rely on here. Again, we see a very quick, fast approach into the round. Player being pinged out there inside of Attic. It isn't going to take much for Muzi. He doesn't need much encouragement at all to make his way on in and get that kill back as a direct trade. Levy going to fall first here, team one. I mean, they don't even need to worry about taking down this shield that's in trophy because now they have control of trophy. And, and opening up the trophy wall basically gives them attic as well. That's really, really difficult for team one to hold on to with that kind of pressure. So... Um, a lot being taken here by NIP, including KDS's life, but Alamal's going to jump into action and remove him off the board too. I love the patience from Muzi there. He had the ping. He knew that someone was there and still he was focused on making sure he wasn't taken from the alternate angle. Alamal's going to pick himself up in a big way here. He's found three kills so far on the round. He's really done something to bring this back into another winnable round, potentially here for Team 1. We've got Julio trying to make an attempt push through into the attic he knows that the diffuser is going to be currently down psycho he's aware of the player inside of the little walk in there that player is going to be alamau he's the hot shot of the map and hot shot of this round he's going to be able to take down julio potentially going to see the ace right here but no it's going to be a trade for the final kill lagonis has to step on in there it was a zed ping for him to work from as well as Knew exactly where he was going to be going inside of that one. Alamo, four kills on the round. When that guy steps up, it all looks very straightforward for Team 1. Yeah, he's been looking very alive uh, in this map. And it was one of the things that um, we discussed earlier was the fact that when Team 1 played on their previous series of the day, Alamo did really well on Oregon and then kind of dropped off a bit in Cafe. Um, and we didn't really know why that was. 
Now, he had a decent game on Cafe this time. It wasn't necessarily anything to write home about, but it was it was okay. It wasn't bad. Uh, but again, he seems to really be finding his footing in Oregon. So maybe it's just something about this map that makes Alamount feel very much at home and empowered, whatever it may be, but it's, it's working. Um, and with Team 1 now just two rounds away from evening things out with NIP, that looks a lot more doable. And especially if you consider that there is someone, and this isn't even considering all of the contributions that everybody else on the team is making. When you consider that there is at least someone on the team who is regularly getting these multi-kills and really popping off, I, if I were on that team, I would be feeling a lot more um, optimistic and comforted about the likelihood of our success. It's how repeatable it is, isn't it? Because you can really attest two of the three rounds that Team 1 have won to Alamau and what he's been able to achieve. He's picked up two 4Ks so far. Now, they're rounds that Team 1 have won because he's been able to go in and do that. And sure, the info has been there. He's been enabled by his team. But he's still been the one that's been pulling the trigger. He's still been the one that has been hitting his shots to get those kills. And you just got to start to think and question, like, how repeatable is that here for Team 1 when they're going for this? Very aggressive play style. NIP, we get a chance to attack now onto uh, onto the kitchen side. We're going to be trying to attack here into kitchen and dining. It's not a site that we saw Team what, uh, to, uh, NIP bring out on their own defenses. But typically the push is going to come through this small office area. Psycho able to sneak a little bit of value there into his twitch drone he's able to remove one of the ads's the other will get burned and that's just going to leave everyone a bit more susceptible to the nades that are going to start flooding in well there's the first one which doesn't get a person but it did get the shield um and having that shield in the showers corridor taken down will inevitably push back the defenders but trades coming in psycho and alamal both falling now, this is very aggressive here from KDS. I suppose he's, he feels he's got to try and take shots where he can if he knows that it's going to push up onto him eventually. But, I mean, he backed off at a good time and didn't get himself caught out. It's quite hard for NIP to drone into showers just because of the placement of the mute jammers. So it, it kind of conceals his placement for now, which will give Team 1 a bit of a boost. Who's going to be trying to push down the shower's corridor as Pino hops himself on in? He's not going to be aware of the player at the top of White Stairs, but it really isn't going to matter as the kills start to fall and Kamikaze left in the pinch. Levy and KDS back to back there, desperately pre-firing onto everything that they could. They're going to pick up that final kill and another round here for Team 1. Slowly but surely, we might have a series on our hands here. It feels it feels it i mean in that round it was just kind of strange because if you if you were to picture that round as a heat map that shows you where everybody was for the majority of the round or whatever how much of nip's heat mappery do you think was actually further on than <laughs> Can you on, maybe not not laugh at my terminology? I would appreciate that. Um, how much of their heat mappery do you think would have actually been <laughs> pushed further forward than Small Tower? I'm I'm really struggling to picture the question because I can't get my head around heat mappery. I'm you know, sorry. Like where their heat map trail is. Yeah, they did, they really didn't make any uh, any serious inroads anywhere else. I think the the deepest they were able to get in was maybe the bottom of white stairs and even then it was somewhere that wasn't sufficiently droned out there was not a lot of vertical pressure which was another bit of a weird one um the push just coming through very flat i think they'd, they'd seen a problem inside of the showers they'd seen the ads's they, they, they saw the uh, the deployable shield and that just became the focus uh, and i think that that was something that uh, they maybe just got a little bit blindsided by there and NIP have got to be careful here. They were very successful on their defensive phase. Oregon is that map where you can see very one-sided halves. And with the way that Team 1 are going here, they're looking quite dangerous to level it up here. Well, it's only going to take one more defensive round for Team 1 to be able to do that. This is, however, you know, the start of the... Or the restart, I should say, of the cycle. So... Um, NIP will probably have an idea of the kinds of thing that it is that Team 1 are going for. And they're just waiting outside this door for now. 
they waiting for? Are they going to rush in? They want to get rid of the default camera? There's no one there. This has become a real trend inside of LATAM where you'll see somebody wait. You'll see two operators waiting together, either on a hatch or next to a doorway for that to be opened, and then they'll burst on through together. And it looks great. Like, it, it looks really cool. But I just don't see the, the true value in it um, from, from, like, a, a competitive point of view. But it certainly looks good. I'm sure that one day we're going to get a great, like, cinematic of something happening. But for the meantime, we're going to be left with Alamau challenging quite heavily onto these freezer stairs. The hatch isn't going to be open. And as such, Pino's just going to dip himself off. He's going down for more. He's trying to draw Alamau out of safety, and which is a good thing that he's decided to back off because I think there's a couple of them up there. Yeah, it's it's not just uh, Pino. We've got Muzi too. So Alamau probably made a good decision there, and they can actually re-centralize back towards the site and figure out where it is that NIP are coming from. I don't know. I mean, Muzi can take the opportunity to actually open up the freezer wall. Cool. That's nice. They want that line of sight. The freezer laundry push is a bit of a trademark here of NIP. Psycho is maybe going to try and impact from the rear stairs as well, based on current placement. Plenty of intel has been gathered here, but there's not a lot of effect that's gone down into the site. A pick that has slipped through the radar until this point is going to be Lagonis on the Warden. Nade come down through. A great nade, excuse me. Great nade onto Lagonis. It doesn't do as much damage as you would have hoped for. Being Pino that threw it, and the kill's going to start to come on in now as Psycho gets taken on out, and you can see him wave his hands in despair. He's not had a great couple of rounds. Kamikaze, he's trying to snake his way on through. Gonna find one onto KDS. How has he been able to crawl all the way in? Oh. Gets two! Trades out onto Lagonis. He's drawn for the pistol. Alamau with the shotgun's gonna shut him down. That's the diffuser cold in the middle of the site. Muzi now next up to the plate. Trying to make something happen. He's gonna be getting pinched from pretty much every single angle. Alamau picks up another there onto Julio to round out the round. And that's gonna level things up here between these two teams. Yep, there's the evening out that we were looking to get. Um, and I mean, it's it's where you have the question where it's like, all right, well, you had your opportunity to adapt on the way things were done back in round number seven. You failed to do so. So how much do we expect that to be a trend going forward or, or be something that you can achieve going forward? You could tell that NIP did try something different. And as much as we joke about the... Um, <laughs> the the way that they decided to move in into the meeting corridor by just kind of bursting through together i assume a lot of it is about trying to take any defenders by surprise who might be in there without alerting them to your presence by droning so they don't want to give away anything by droning therefore they don't know if there is anybody there so they've got to do it in a coordinated way to ensure that they can get that kill if it's needed so they wanted to take team one off guard and take them by surprise the thing is team one didn't play into that hand so nip's kind of approach on how they want to or how they wanted to adapt in that last round wasn't necessarily in sync with the way that team one were playing um which is where you question what's going to happen in this next round for example because nip are looking to be bringing the same thing that they did last time they attacked onto kids storms Two four split is all that's required here from NIP to walk away the winner. So it really isn't uh, an insurmountable task. And I kind of like to see them slow down a little bit in that approach. They've been very measured, very careful in the first couple of opening rounds, and since then, and things have got gotten very aggressive. And I think that's demonstrated there with KDS just getting himself into a narrow engagement. NIP are paying no heed to. Uh, Getting themselves onto that repel and starting to challenge very quickly onto these players. Just getting caught out in a little bit of late setup. Kamikaze going to be rocking the ace this time. Maybe going to try and make something happen. I haven't seen any Maverick play really at all. And again, something that's maybe a little bit unusual is the, the actual focus that's been going on to 
taking map control. Instead, Muzi's just focused on pushing through Trophy Door. It's where we saw him have some success previously. And in this round, it's where we're going to see him be the opening pick. KDS there finding the success. He'll be opening onto the games room wall with the Selmers. Now they're just holding those angles through. Now, last time NIP were actually pretty good at taking this trophy control and opening up the wall, which you can see that Team 1 have fully reinforced this time, whereas it wasn't before. And I believe it was Muzi who could get it open with the Ash Charges. Not that he's around to do that now anyway. But it does mean that someone like Levy, for example, can hold control here in pit for a lot longer than was able last time because NIP was so proficient at being able to shift him out before. Julio going to be repositioning himself now. Going to be on the Capitao and could have a big part to play in this execute. Going to get himself onto the double window. He knows that there's going to be a player that's going to be hiding inside main dorms. Psycho now able to push his way through into Trophy as well. He's not had a great couple of rounds and this one isn't going to be any better. Again, we get the hand up in the air. Exasperated look on the face. He really hasn't seen any success in the, in the in the last three rounds, really. NIP now looks to be in a very precarious situation. Julio out on the repel. He's going to be taken on down. Lagornis, he's going to shut Kamikaze up. And Pino left in the one versus five. He knows where the diffuser is. He probably knows where a few of the players from Team 1 are as well. As demonstrated, removing KDS, his head there. Really, what is he capable of doing here? Drawn for the SMG, picks up another on to Alamau. Team want to throw in themselves at this one. There's still 15 seconds left. The pre-fire from Lagonis will be true. Team one put themselves onto a map point here. This, I mean, this is crazy. This is this is not the NIP that we saw in map one, and it's not the NIP that we saw in the first half of this game either. So, what has happened to them? They just don't seem to be together at all. They're missing various, like, like angles and getting caught out in places that we would not necessarily have expected from them previously. It's a very strange change. It is. It, it looks like an entirely different side. You're right. Um, it's, it's odd to see NIP this down uh it's not a position that we're used to seeing them in that they can't seem to win a couple of gunfights in a row here uh, and team one are all over them like a rash at this moment in time and they've got all the momentum in the world they're gonna be very happy with the performance that they've put in here on oregon there was a question mark coming into this map it is nip's most banned map we didn't know what we were gonna see what we were gonna expect here Obviously, that means that doesn't mean they don't play it. This isn't the first time they've played it in a long time. Of course not. They're going to scrim it. They're going to have practice on it. They're, they're going to know what they're doing here. But we just haven't seen it as, as viewers to, to get to enjoy and watch and understand how they want to try and play Oregon. And, and so far, they've really struggled on their attacks. Um, it isn't something that uh, we, we've seen them really heavily contend with. A lot of these rounds have been very clear cut toward Team 1. Now, of course, they have the momentum and... We're faced with the prospect of all three maps here. We're faced with the prospect of a coastline. It's really odd as well when you consider that we were really heavily praising NIP for their attacking prowess over the course of the last stage. And suddenly, it seems to be a different story here on Oregon. Now, last time NIP attacked onto this site, they had a pretty tough time of really trying to get anywhere. They couldn't even break into showers. They cleared some utility in Shower's Corridor, which was nice. They didn't attempt to go upstairs, which we saw in the prep phase. Team 1 did a decent job of reinforcing, and they have somebody up there to guard it. So even if NIP decide to go for that this time, it's going to be kind of hard. There's the EMP followed by a Selma, so they'll at least be able to get the Shower's Wall open. It's just a question of can they shift out KDS, because last time the answer to that was no. We might be about to see a very carefully measured attack here from NIP. Already we can see things moving a little bit slower, well into a minute into the round, and we haven't seen any significant engagement take place. NIP are no longer so hyper-focused on removing that shield, and this time they brought double hard breach, so surely there's something they're going to try and find some value to be had out of that. Shield will be just 
destroyed just outside of showers. The second nade comes in now from Pino, and it's going to land straight onto Alamau. That's a really beautiful nade, and that should give NIP a bit of a boost now that they have the opening kill and a man advantage in the first time for what feels like forever. This Yokai drone is watching straight on to NIP, and I suspect that that allowed that kill onto Kamikaze before Muzi got onto KDS. This could actually give NIP the opening that they need to get into showers, though, as KDS was that defender looking into it. And you can tell by where Muzi is right now. This is control that they lacked before. Oh. Beautiful kill onto Lagonis. This is going to open so much up for the team. It really is, because regardless of where those Yokai drones are now, they're not going to be moving any longer, and they can't be used to stun out. So NIP have bought themselves a bit of valuable time there. The Diffuser now going to get juggled as Julio gets chunked on down. Pino with the crossfire is going to be able to get one out as a trade there as Levy takes down Psycho. But now Levy really has it all to do. He's going to find one over onto Pino. Two more to find. 20 seconds to hold on. Levy, it really looks like he's going to do this one here. Is he going to take this one all the way to coastline? Julio, he's one HP in a dream. He has the Z ping. Oh, Levy oh. hits the shots. What a clutch there from Levy. Team one. They lock in Oregon. We are confirmed going to all three maps tonight in this grand final. Absolutely no way. No way that just happened. I, I honestly thought that that was NIP's round and that we were going to be going into an overtime and who knows how that would have gone. But Levy, you beast. <laughs> You're an absolute beast. And I am so very excited to be going to Coastline because of how much of a brawl that map has been uh, in, in these playoffs. So I can't imagine it'll be any different for this one. And there, there's so much behind it too. What a game for Levy. He finished on nine kills. He got four in the final round. He's done, he's scraped on by throughout that game, and then he's coming when it counts. What a scrouty round bit of Sage there. Tell you what, it was uh, <laughs> it was pretty incredible to see how that one went out. And I think, you know, there were a lot of people uh, expecting NIP to come in and just walk all over uh, Team 1, really assert their dominance. But no, look, Team 1 have dug deep, especially after the first map. We thought, well, maybe this is going to go the way of NIP. But no, Team 1 have said, not today, sir. And uh, as a result, we're heading to Coastline for another decider. Ollie, we've been to Coastline a bunch of times to, to figure out what's exactly what's what this weekend. And uh, we're going to do it one more time, mate. Yeah, it just seems like this is the uh, sort of map of choice for the decider inside of uh, the LATAM region. It, it kind of makes a lot of sense. You know, people talk about Coastline and there's a lot of, uh, it's a very hot topic as to whether you, you're either a lover or a hater, really. Uh, I personally quite like it. I think it can be exciting. Um, but yeah, it seems like we're going there again. Gio's over there shaking red. She's the... She's the yin to the yang, you know? Mm, yeah, yeah, needs yeah. To be removed from the map <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness me. Mate, you better, you better be careful. You better put your oven gloves on before you start uh, chucking out hot takes like that. <laughs> um, look, we are going to go to Coastline. It's a map we've seen a fair bit of uh, throughout coverage of not only the uh, the BR6, but also this weekend at the Latam League Finals. However, before we get there, we've got to set ourselves up with a bit of a break here. We'll uh, get everything ready to go, and we'll be back with our third and deciding match between these two teams and crown a champion so don't go anywhere we're back with live coverage of the very last match of the latam league final just a few minutes Habla mucho, mucho, pero donde están los jeres, baby, que no los veo Los dos en la pista, esto se puso feo Cha, cha, duro, 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 pam, pam Ejo, le gusta lo malo, lo underground Duro, 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 pam, pam Churi, no queja al que sea en primer round Duro, 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 pam, pam Ejo, le gusta lo malo, lo underground Duro, 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 pam, pam Siempre estamos a la altura, pero perriamos el bien Vamos a pecar con perreo, baby Te veo con un flow criminal Aquí en el party se siente como el ambiente No lleva a otro lugar Con perreo se entona Todo está mojera, también en la zona Solo cuando pone freaky, 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 tona Canta como loca, porque se emociona Yeah 
Party, party, nos ponemos farria, nos encanta el perreo. Uh, habla mucho, mucho, pero ¿dónde están los haters, baby? Que no los veo. Uh, los dos en la pista, esto se puso feo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Duro, 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 pam, pam. Yeah. Le gusta lo malo, lo underground. Yeah. Duro, 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 pam, pam. Seguro yeah. que es el que siempre me around. Uh, duro, 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 pam, pam. Yeah. Yeah. Le gusta lo malo, lo underground.
After a hard fought stage two, we have whittled our competitors to a group stage here at the LATAM League Finals and winnowed them down further to just two teams that remain standing here with one map of Siege left to play for us to determine the winner of the LATAM League Finals. You're about to watch it live. My name's Riley Knight, joined by Gio and Ollie. The cast is a $10,000 prize going to the team that takes this one out, 5K per second as part of the $35,000 prize book this entire weekend. And I tell you what, it's been a long one, Gio. But the, uh, the players on both teams are going to have to dig deep, find that little uh, that little bit of extra fuel and get across the line here. I'll be honest, I was amazed that Team 1 had the extra fuel required to get through Oregon because for the first map and a half, that did not look like it was happening. So I kind of feel like I have no doubts that there is that fuel in the engine. Um... It's just about who has more of it. I mean, Ninjas in Pajamas um, have looked pretty good on Coastline. I would say more so than Team 1 over the course of these playoffs, if you just consider their, their scoreline against um, Team Liquid compared to Team 1's against Furia, which went into overtime. But, uh, I don't know, t like, Ninjas in Pajamas in the latter half of that last game, I have a lot of question marks surrounding that, and I... I don't know if those question marks are going to continue into this last game. Oh, yeah. Look, the, the teacher's up the front in front of the whiteboard, got the bloody rollout going through it, saying who's here, who's here, and no one's putting their hand up. Well, no one turned up for class during the second half of the day. They've all gone home after lunch. Ollie, Ninja Super Jabs, they need to come back. They need to reassert themselves as they did in the first map. Uh, otherwise, Team 1 here at the moment, we've seen what happens when they get momentum, and at the moment, the momentum is definitely with them. Quite possibly. It's, it's time for NIP to stand up and prove why they are a tournament team. Uh, and this is the best opportunity to do so. All right, well, we're going to find out right here and right now. We are about to crown a champion, my friends. We head down to Coastline for the third and final match of this grand final. Take it away, Geo and Ollie. Thank you very much, Riley. This is where we decide who is going to be the winner here tonight. We have got Coastline for our decider. It really does seem to be the way that these Latam teams want to go as... It has been the decider in the previous two matches as well. Already in and amongst this banning phase here. Lion Thatcher are going to be removed. We're going to see Team 1 now choose to get rid of the old Vigil. So, uh, that's probably a good pick, honestly. You could, you yeah. can, you could throw, throw a dart at a wall and uh, wherever it'd land, it'd land on someone that, on the side of NIP that plays that operator. Yeah, I mean, Psycho especially has been playing a lot of Vigil. Um, NIP really like to go on their big roam, so it doesn't surprise me. It's very different bands to what we saw Team 1 go for earlier on in the day, which was Flores and Aruni, which I would say... And Aruni, I would understand against NIP, but Flores would definitely have been a lot more, um, you know, tailored towards Furia. So you can tell that Team 1 are very specifically going for those operators that they think NIP would benefit from the most. Yeah, the the, uh, the Flores bans are, are quite a, quite an interesting one because it was something that we did see NIP bring quite a bit against Liquid. Um, I think you'll have been trudging your way through central London at that point, but it was something that they yeah. used to try and uh, gain control of, uh, particularly through the through the vents in the roof. Um, it was something that NIP did uh, did quite as a, as a quite a conscious decision. Um, now it's something that we maybe see Team One bringing out here as well as Alamo has. Six picked on into it. I mean, as if the attackers needed anything else, another piece of kit to add to their sort of overflowing arsenal here on coastline. Uh, obviously, we've had we've had lion removed here, and that's uh, one of the one of the fun things about coast is you do get to see a little bit of lion action. But still, there's just a plethora of operators that you can bring to uh, really assist you here on the attack. So this is another a rook. I'm sure Riley's going to be um, happy about that one. He got so excited before <laughs> when rook came out. This time, I'd imagine it is to um, kind of help out with the fact that a Jaeger hasn't been brought at all. But it's always, it's always nice to have a cheap little Aegog as well. Um, but yes, not, not one of those operators that we always see here on uh, Coastline. I suppose in most maps. I'm interested to see how that one's going to go. Warden 2. Uh, I mean, that allows for the second shield, especially. Um, but there aren't any smokes being played on the side of Team 1. So his gadget's kind of meaningless. 
these lineups are very mismatched, aren't they? You know, we look on the side of NIP, nobody's running the shotgun. We've, we've got a warden, a mute, and a smoke, and nobody we, is running the shotgun. We had that on the last day of PR6 as well, do you remember? Yeah, it was weird. They did the MP5K and the FMG9. I mean, you've also, got the impacts, but so, so I guess you still get your rotates, but it's still weird to see. I'm just going to point out, MP5K on mute, I saw a certain Sternab say that that was a plat saw 3 that. thing to do. Yeah, I saw um, that. Kamikaze would like a word. Yeah. Someone make that happen on Twitter, quote tweet it and all that sort of stuff. And I mean, obviously, if, if Kamikaze wins the round off the back of his gun skill alone, then that would uh, really add to the cause there. But we'll see how much of an impact it has. It's certainly going to give NIP a bit more potential to challenge quite heavily on these gunfights. They're not going to be restricted by horrible recoils to control and small magazine counts of smg 11s instead they're going to have you know a little bit more bite and a bit more opportunity muzi going to be the first fall here as kds finds some success but vertically julio is able to gain a refrag still going for these kills julio is going to break through into security i'm not sure there's anyone too close to him i can't see any orange silhouettes nearby I mean, Neskin's basically directly above him, but that's so much of a problem. Not so much of a problem right now, Lagonis. You don't kill your teammates. At least he can get Psycho and with the knife, no less, as Team 1 continue to clear up on NIP. But still, that's an ouch. Julio in a good position to try and flank and do something here. Pino now going to be getting pressure as Julio furthers his way in through Aquarium, but the final two kills come in a flash. Levy, he saw so much success from this double window. He's going to finish things out there. Keeping an eye on the flank. Recognizing that site control was already taken. And Julio trying to be that difference maker. But unable to be so. Well. Going to be going downstairs into blue and sunrise it looks like. And this is practically the same lineup from NIP. They didn't have a lesion last time. Um, and naturally lesion is going to be a lot more useful to kind of physically prevent people from walking into the site itself. I It makes sense because why would you have wanted the Warden in that last round? You wouldn't really. Now that a Twitch is being brought by the attackers, then maybe there would have been more reason to have a Warden. Um, but they don't know that right now because she's been six pick on anyway. I think it's the threat of the ying, isn't it? And then you see the six pick come through and you think, you know, we probably made the right choice there in not bringing the warden. But it's a threat that you've really got to take into account that if Alamar's going to be flashing the ying and eventually playing it, um, it's always going to be in the back of your mind there as NIP. And as you mentioned, Joe, again, a, a, a bit of a, a strange lineup. I think it, honestly, I think it's the rook that, that makes it look so, so sort of odd. And I guess it really is just because oh, yeah, we're not seeing... Fine. We're just not seeing the Jaeger. We're not seeing any sort of denial. Yeah, it's it's very odd to not have that. Because while I talk about the fact that Rook obviously is good against projectiles, that's only for protecting yourself. Whereas usually the way that you would use those ADSs for a Jaeger is not really protect to protect you per se, but it's more to protect the utility. Um, and then, you know, by extension, the utility is usually there to protect you. But Rook can't do both of those things. No, he really can't. We'll have to see how that's going to affect NIP here. KDS is going to be quickly droning into Kitchen. He knows that Legion is going to be somewhere nearby. That's where Pino is going to be playing, just on the threshold. He's already thrown out a couple of goo mines and not quite giving the game away. It's pretty obvious that somebody is going to be in there, but still it's a challenge that needs to be taken. The pre-fire now going to start to come through as vertical pressure is going to be enough to force Pino out of position. He joins forces with Psycho there, just behind main desk. Still waiting for someone to really go for that first engagement. Alamal's not gonna hang around too much at the window, even though maybe he could have had an opportunity if he had chosen to. Aggressive positioning as well from NIP over uh, in office. They have actually a lot of their defense that is still down on the bottom floor. I think all five of them, in fact, are down there. So, uh, team one... Oh, okay. 
Wait, was Rook upstairs? Yes. <laughs> Team 1 will have a bit of an easier time actually opening the, the vertical angles if they decide they want to do that. But right now, they still, for the most part, haven't entered into the building. We're over halfway through. They're finally going to get some of the hard breach going to uh, open up some of these walls from pool. But KDS eventually becomes the first one to fall. It's really been a long time coming, that opening pick. It seems like it's a round that's taken a long time and the players have danced around each other for quite some time. Well into the final minute now, but kills starting to come in for NIP. Playing the patient game and letting Team 1 run on into them. Alamau would be next up as he gets himself into an engagement inside a kitchen. Worried about the prospect of a flank and instead he's going to have to dip on back. Neskin. He's going to try and enter on through into Sauna, but he too will be taken down. Alamau has got to step up in a big way. We've seen him do it before, but he hasn't got a lot of time to execute in here. He's going to find four kills in 15 seconds. Currently, he's going to be inside of that garden area. Looking to push on through now. Gets taken out by Kamikaze. He's laying prone on the cool vibe stairs. NIP get themselves around here. Yeah, I mean, Team 1 really just didn't have any way into the building. Uh, no. They maybe could have been a bit more assertive if they did, decided to go upstairs. Um, but NIP had presence over in Kitchen. They had presence on the site. They had presence in Office. They had presence upstairs. And so either way, they were going to face some kind of pushback, regardless of what route they decided to go for. Um, evidently, the fact that I think they were so fractured out didn't help with the assertiveness that they could have had. But eh, regardless, NIP will be moving on to kitchen and service for their next site. Again, it's a very similar lineup, just slight changes. They haven't got the Malusi this time. They don't have a Legion this time. They've reverted back to bringing Warden, um, which I suppose is, is, is okay, because they'll, of course, know that Twitch was bought in that last round. And again, Alamau is six-picked onto Twitch again. So, especially here on Kitchen, where you are, I think, more likely to expect a smoke plant than any of the other sites, I would say that the Warden's a lot more justifiable. It is. At this point, I am really heavily questioning why a Jaeger isn't being brought here. It, it just seems like the obvious choice it's going to solve a couple of problems for nip it frees up the rook pick it frees up the warden pick and they can start to bring a couple of other options but maybe it's a question we will get to pose depending on how this game finishes pino he's got a bit of a idea that a lot of people are getting themselves up onto the repel but for the time being he's just going to hold himself back maybe just play for a drone it's arguably as valuable as a couple of chip points of damage it's going to remove something away from these attackers and already the drones for team one have dwindled down to six yeah i mean they were kind of struggling with their drones back on oregon as well even though on cafe they weren't having too terrible a time with them so it's kind of an odd one to have um it means that if they lose any more which they have they're down to five now they're going to rely a lot more on face checking, which we know how that can be. You get too aggressive, you swing around a corner. I mean, what's going to go on there? The goddess has been able to open up an angle there. Expose Julio somewhat. But it really is maybe something that could come back to hurt the attackers as well. Now, there hasn't been what I would call a, a comprehensive clear of the top floor so far. It's not an approach that Team 1 have chosen to take. Instead, they're really trying to get themselves advantages through challenging on into these different windows and doorways. Finally, we get a bit of presence up here, but Alamau is instantly traded. And because Alamau was acting alone inside of the theater, there's not going to be anyone there for the refrag. It's going to be Levy to come through luggage. Find one on Topino. Now, has he got up-to-date accurate information? The answer is no. Psycho there, ready and waiting to take him on down. Still the time an advantage for team one but what about this psycho he jumps himself out of the big window hits a triple on the round and says julio it's on you from here 
Lagonis, he's going to be getting the plant down under the cover of KDS. Julio going to go for the swing. Lands a good couple of shots there, but he's not going to have much ammo left inside of the Vector. The C4 comes out. It won't be successful. Hits the reload. Looks to try and make his way on in. Still ducking and diving. Seeing if he can get the opening. ADS there with the pre-fire will be successful. We finally see a plant geo. Yeah, I was thinking the exact same thing. This is the first, not just the first plant, but the first attempt at a plant that we've seen throughout the entire series so far. Um, and yeah, at the end there, Team 1 basically won that off the back of the, the kill that they got because... Uh, there were a lot of back and forths leading up to that. And I think that Team 1 probably faced a bit more adversity than they could have, purely based on the fact that NIP had quite a lot of presence upstairs. So if you've got someone like Psycho who's ready to swing into theater, um, then great, you're going you're gonna to have all of that backwards and forwards. And really the only person who was applying any pressure upstairs prior to that was Levy, and he was doing so from the roof trying to hold angles through into luggage trying to spray into pink and also down towards cool vibes as well so uh, that was really it from that perspective and i think that's what led to quite a lot of the bloodbath in the middle of the round but as soon as there was space enough for team one to plant um and then you know they win the one versus one at the end that was required then of course they put the round on the board regardless of, of the control that nip had previously in the round Well, back upstairs we go into hooker and billiards opportunity again here for team one it's a side they were successful in in round number one i'm going to be coming up against a couple of spawn peaks here though pino just not going to hold it for long enough sad to see as he would have maybe had a chance there again nip are rocking the no shotguns allowed combination instead relying on the impact that Psycho is going to bring on the Rook for the two rotations that they require. But it really does limit what they're able to do, not only in terms of rotation, but also in terms of vertical. They're not able to open any of those vertical angles. They're going to struggle in any sort of off-site prep and setup as well. What they're not going to struggle in is opening engagements. Pino eventually braves a repeat on the window and will be able to take down levy alamau comes out with the trade neskin now going to be looking to push in through from that aquarium side the forest drones are getting prepped to lead the way into the site itself so of course they know that the shield's in the back they can get rid of that pretty well nip cleared that space so pino can just hold cool vibes for now and it could give Team 1 uh, a bit of room. And they're looking like they're going to be coming in through Aqua as well. But Psycho is trying to hold on to the angle. I mean, at least the, at least Team 1, they have this presence on either side of the site. They, they want to form this pinch. And that's how Lagonis is going to be going in for the plant. Try and keep the defenders distracted. But Julio getting the kill onto Alamau is going to give him access to a lot more room. It's not going to stop the plant, however. Yeah, the plant does go down. But at what cost? At this point, Neskin being the only one alive. He's going to be outside on the repel. This nade has to be picture perfect. And it won't be. Julio is there with the cover. The Disable already being stuck. And IP successful with the retake. A desperate plant. Not under ideal circumstances. Losing Levy there early for Team 1 was a real big problem. We cast our minds back to how that round went down in round number 1. Levy was the player that was on the big window. Cutting through the site. Able to take down a couple of players and really lock off all the angles had he been in position to do so or had anyone else from the side of team one taken up that location we maybe see that plant sticking for just a little bit longer so two successful plants for team one but only one of the rounds went to them and now nip returning back downstairs I mean, again, we've seen this composition. It's all very similar. And my big criticism of Team 1 last time they attacked onto this site 
was the fact that they didn't look super cohesive and at no point did they really make any progress in actually making it into the building um you know the fact that lagonis actually opened up the pool wall was nice i like the fact that they're being active in their use of hard breach even on a site like kitchen where you you can go a very long time without seeing any hard breach be used to be perfectly honest um i think maybe it would have been more ideal had he done it a little bit sooner and i i know naturally it involves removing certain pieces of utility if you have denial involved in this case you don't for the walls um maybe if they'd done it a bit sooner they would have had a more streamlined idea of how to actually get into the site itself because back in round number two that just seemed to be what was lacking for team one See how this top floor clear comes in this time. Already shields and utility going to be getting dealt with inside of Hookah. Muzi going to be on the hunt for the drones. KDS and Alamau had quite a lot to say on clearing out this top floor previously. But there just was a, a little bit of a disconnect between the two players and they weren't quite able to get trades off as effectively as they would maybe like. Something we've not seen yet so far today is any Nomad play. Uh, and that could really assist in some of these tentative holds that Team 1 are getting themselves into. But at least Levy is going to be successful inside of that one. Taking down Pino, this time not being the first blood, but instead involved in the engagement in a positive way. Uzi will respond, taking down KDS. And with it, a lot of information and a couple of nades. Here's Lagoon is getting ready with the Ex-Kairos, but is not in the same position that he was before. He's actually going to be using it upstairs and wants to open up Hooker. I'm going to hold that angle all the way down, and you can see that Julio has got to be aware of it because he's kind of trapped in that corner, and as a direct result, he'll be trading out places with Muzi. Muzi's better equipped to be holding on to cool vibes, I guess. And he's going to be trying to deal with one versus one against Lagonis. But there is a nice shot from Neskin to come in and just trap him. That gives Team 1 all the space in the world upstairs directly above the site. Something they failed to acquire last time. And this could be a game changer for them. They can get maybe a pick from above. They already have the man advantage. They're very close to getting one as Julio loses about half his health. Someone I've got a little bit of time to work with here as well. And in terms of the execute, Kamikaze going to be trying to smoke on off. Alamal going to gather the intel there on the Flores drone. Kamikaze has to push back on through, but he is able to take down Lagonis. A key kill here inside of the round as that's Diffuser. Not in a handy location to be collected, honestly, with only 20 seconds left to go. Someone's going to have to try and push on in and pick that kit up. Kamikaze still can just continue to watch. Another Flores drone is going to come on through and deal a little bit of damage as a hot drop has to come in from Levy. He's going to land one. He's going to pick up a second Levy. A big round here, but it isn't going to be enough. Julio, he just hides out inside a blue. Not quite a cool vibe stairs, but still acting like a cool cat sitting there just behind the wall knowing that all he's got to do is waste a couple of seconds. Just acting like a cool cat. Cool cat. Whatever you say. Whatever you say. It we is whatever I say, Gio. <laughs> quite, quite a few rounds it, throughout the entire course of this series now that have been one on time. Like, more than you would usually expect from a regular series. Yeah, I think you're right. It's... Uh... It's been a little bit of a strange one in that regard. I think it's just how teams are happy to let things happen. And it's it's something we've seen NIP be very comfortable with in the past is the clock. And if they're happy to just say, you know what, we're just going to let this one run out on time. We're going to stay alive. Then maybe that's the call. The Diffuser was in a really awkward position there for Team 1. And it was always going to have to come down to the kills as soon as Lagonus got taken out. Well, that was the first round of all the rounds here on Coastline that was uh, won by the team who won the previous round. So, uh, I mean, maybe NIP will keep up that streak, finish on a 4-2 at the half here on Coastline. 
They obviously had a really dominant game against Team Liquid. It was a 7-3 victory for them, whereas Team 1's game against Furia was 8-7. Uh, so um, that went all the way into overtime. And that's not to say that this game couldn't go into overtime, but NIP have already got that proven track record literally from today. That they're pretty strong on, um, on Coastline. So we'll see how this fares and if they can keep it up, because... It, it hasn't looked, uh, I mean, definitive one way or the other, but a lot of the things that have happened here on Coastline have looked more to come down to the gunfights, especially when you consider this NP5 FMG kind of style that NIP have been going for, which by default just says, yeah, we want to shoot. It's worth noting that a lot of the rounds for NIP came on that attacking side as well. They were actually able to go flawless against Liquid on the attack. And that was the thing that really set them apart from the rest. So there's still time for that uh, side swap to come in. This is going to be the last round here as the sides currently sit. And then we do get to see NIP maybe stretch the legs on, on a map that they are very confident on at the moment. But still, this is a chance for Team 1 to level things up. Because they're going to be attacking into the kitchen site yet again. Now, this top floor clear that we've seen from Team 1, it's been very, very soft both times. But with the stack up of players above the bathroom hatch, and you already see one player dropping on in. Alamar going to drone out ahead. A very well placed Flora's drone. Prime and ready to remove that deployable shield and put the pressure on Muzi right from the get go. And when Muzi got taken out here before, this is where Psycho was well equipped to just jump straight into action. You can see he's right next to him, just in case. But he doesn't even need to avenge Muzi or anything because he can just get the kill straight onto Neskin. There's the avenging. Finally, it came in. Team 1 struggling to push in through Master and Theater as they had been the last time they came to deal with this site. I mean, the round isn't exactly won and lost in this top floor clear, but it isn't something that we see Team 1 be so successful in. Levy will eventually be able to find out Psycho. Psycho trying to scurry out of Alamal's flashbang range and instead will get himself stuck into a crossfire. Now the Flora's drone is being used to open up vertically, but Pino is able to take down Levy from behind main desk. Alamal now drops, looking for a bit of access in through kitchen window. These are desperate measures. If Alamar tries to hop in, he's going to be greeted and greeted by the P10 Roni of Pino. Magonis, the last alive regularly. This is the case. He's in the one versus three, and he's got 15 seconds to try and make something happen to save NIP. Seeing a very dominant side, and well, NIP are going to see it. A 4 2 split here. Pino, he's going to pick up the last two kills inside of that round. There wasn't a lot there for Lagonis and Alamar to accomplish. No, and honestly, like, looking back on those six rounds, the only one that I can really pinpoint as saying that Team 1 had a decent upstairs clear was in round five, and they didn't even win round five because of the time at the end. Um, but, yeah, in, in rounds three and six, at, which are the two times that they visited Kitchen, they really struggled with that. I, funnily enough, in round three is when they planted and they won the round. But it certainly wasn't off the back of getting a good upstairs clear. That that was not it. It's really something that they've struggled with tonight here on this map. And I mean, attack as a whole has been a pretty torrid time for Team 1 throughout the course of not only this Grand Finals, but also quarterfinals prior to this. Team 1 have uh, really struggled in that regard. And you do wonder how they're going to fare when they get down to uh, to the Major in a couple of weeks' time in Mexico, because obviously that's where they're going to get pushed and pressured even more so. But for the time being inside of this match, they're going to be switching sides. They're going to be on the defense, and they now have a chance to try and uh, flick that mental switch and change things around a little bit here. NIP, though, they're in a dangerous position. We've seen them play on Coastline already tonight. We've seen them attack very well tonight. And uh, you just do wonder how quickly this one could slip through Team 1's fingers. Well, I guess we'll find out. We've got plenty of time in which to do so. Team 1 are actually bringing a Jaeger with them and going for maybe a, a composition that we would feel more comfortable looking at. <laughs> 
it's a bit more pleasing to the eye isn't it it is it is um you know and we we know that they they like to play the echo they actually haven't decided to bring smoke so that's their only anchor that they're going for here uh, everybody else can really be played off site um and i would imagine that they'll they'll probably lean into that flexibility that they have to do so now nip are going to be spending some time droning and uh I did that pest catch out a drone directly or no i don't think it did i think that was the pest that we're looking at so nip do drive into it nip with a very direct approach here they're not looking for much more than they need there is going to be levy playing below but on Echo, he's not going to have a C4, so he doesn't have much room to uh, really affect the plant vertically that way. Instead, he's going to be looking to try and use his yokais. We do see an opening kill come in onto Alamao, so it'll be one of the three C4s that Team 1 were bringing out of action. It's forced Lagonus, sorry, it's forced Levy into a rotate as well. He's now had to get himself up a little bit higher. Pino, though, is going to be seeing a lot of success. It's a very narrow angle on that tarps repel. But he certainly finds a lot of kills through it. Team 1 are going to be rotating through and getting caught out as they move back on into sight. Levy will find one onto Psycho. Could potentially see a second here, but the pressure is just going to be too much. Pino's on a triple kill from the same position. Drops himself off the repel, but Neskin pushes on through. Takes down Kamikaze, the diffuser now on the threshold to Hooker. Julio is going to come in. And take down Neskin. KDS, he has to hit his shots. It finds one, can't find the second. Julio floods on into the site. There was information on KDS there. What a clean round there from NIP. Oh, I mean, it was really nice. Um, and I think the way that they, uh, again, they, you know, opened up the the reinforced wall on Hooker with the x Kairos pellet, it put so much pressure on that position at Vars. Um, and in a lot of cases that won't necessarily be opened and it means it's harder to flush out that defender from that space. So it either forces them into submission and into, you know, passiveness, or you force them to rush forward into the site and get aggressive, which is what team one did. And they got a couple of nice kills out of it, but still NIP had that surrounding presence, which meant that they could always get that trade. And it's something we spoke about all the way back in cafe was NIP a, a very good, especially on the attack, at having the the trade positions. So um, it was a really, really nice round from them, especially as they just, they didn't need to do a ton of encroaching themselves. They had a lot of control of Hooker. And you compare that to Team 1, who on their attack, they came in from an aqua push and didn't actually put tons of pressure on Hooker themselves. kind of bold from team one to go back here again because i mean realistically what are you going to do about pino on that repel he was a menace he found himself three kills and there isn't a great deal that you can really do to directly deal with that now potentially a run out potentially somebody getting a, uh, a c4 out there or something of that nature but if we see a similar execute enabled by nip it be a very similar result here time will tell for the meantime it looks as though they've not stacked that hooker side of the map too heavily instead they're going to be going in through the kitchen a couple of pests that are going to be in their way as the drone work is just going to be slowed down ever so slightly but psycho is able to get himself in and discover that the majority of office and the bottom of blue bar are clear at least clear enough for him to hop on in Still, a lot of droning. I'm really interested in this Kaid pick just because of what I mentioned about the, the breaching from NIP being as effective as it was. Now it's all gone over onto uh, the pink wall, which is typically, an, and, and of course the hookah wall as well. So the pink wall is typically where you would expect a breach to be done onto this site. The hookah wall is, of course, uh, where they did it in the last round. So given how useful that was for NIP in their last round, you know, this could be a difference maker. 
Um, and you can see they don't have quite as much of a, a surrounding presence on Hooker as they did before, and they're they're going in for a different approach and to maybe come round from a different angle because that spot is not going to be as accessible to them. It was a good bit of adaptation from Team 1. They've been able to solve a little bit of a problem there, and it's forced a very different approach. Open engagement is being threatened. I'm not sure that Muzi knows where KDS is. He certainly doesn't. He doesn't even glance to his right. KDS gifted a chance at a freebie, and he'll take it. Shuts down Muzi. Still a job to be done here as positions are now being established. Pino has got himself onto his favoured repel location and will start to dish out the damage. Levy is going to take a ton of shots as Julio takes down Lagonis. You know, just going to try and find an alternate angle onto Levy. He knows he's only going to be one bullet away at this point. No nade in pocket. One nade in pocket, excuse me. But he has got the chance to try and make something happen with that as well. Oh, a bit of a bit of a misdrone there. Psycho isn't going to be having as much information as he perhaps could like. Still enough to chunk down KDS. But if he tries to aggressively push on in, Neskin is here and Neskin is unaccounted for. There's a live ping onto Kamikaze and Neskin can cause the damage here. The kill's flooding for Team 1. Yeah, that was a, a round. I appreciate the fact that NIP wanted to go for a different approach, but it felt like they took the longest way round they could possibly have thought of. Um, and... The fact that that uh, Kai made such a difference in their ability to do what they wanted to do is, I almost want to say a little bit concerning, um, but they just spent so much time doing what they just tried to do, and there were moments where you could tell they were lacking vigilance, you know, like with the Muzi and KDS thing, they just weren't necessarily paying attention enough. Um, and yeah, it came to punish them. It made it harder and harder to actually execute on the push as time went on because you got fewer people working on it. Not the best round from NIP, and especially when you consider that the previous one was actually quite good. It almost looked night and day. The previous one was such a set piece. It was really well rehearsed and it looked just, it looked so flawless. And then you look at that and you're like, oh, guys, there was one mute jammer that was stopping you. Like, figure it out you know like just just work something out to, to deal with that one mute jammer and and then get the wall open the same as you did inside of round number one uh, and it was something that really started to slow them down so i guess uh one of those unfortunate circumstances where you do just come over a little bit of a stumbling block and i appear now gonna be attacking onto double bar inside of sunrise and blue we're yet to see uh, a sort of very aggressive approach from NIP, and it's something that the it's a round they like to throw in every now and then, so we've got to keep our eyes out for it. I'm not sure if we're going to see it inside of this game, if I'm being honest with you, but it would be nice to see them just inject a little bit more pace because they do tend to work well under that pressure. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they have... One thing I will say is they have a lot of utility to get rid of utility. They've got four nades and they have all the forest drones too. So there's a lot that they can do here. And when you consider the fact that removing utility was part of the problem that NIP had in the last round, suddenly having really everything they need to, to deal with whatever it might be could make a substantial difference, potentially. Or maybe it won't. Maybe it'll be a disaster. But um, the Flores is really what I'm going to be looking at. And you can already hear it detonating. Although that was above. So I guess it opens up some of the vertical holes. And I would assume that there was probably something up there as well. It's scary how much damage the Flores drone does to floors. It, it really is uh, pretty pretty shocking. It's, it's a good little pseudo breaching charge or, or a swing of Sledge's hammer really in a pinch if that's what you need. And it just speaks further to the flexibility of the operator. There isn't a flank watch that's being brought here by NIP, and you can just start to see orange silhouettes getting a little bit antsy. We're seeing players thinking about maybe making that rotation. Lagonis, for one, is happy to challenge on these cool vibe stairs. We've got KDS and Levy 
maybe about to pull off a little bit of a flank here. They will be greeted if they walk up those stairs, although Pino for the time being has rotated off, so maybe they're going to have a free ride, but we can just see there is going to be a silhouette directly above them that we'll be watching off on that flank. They've made so much noise as well. Julio, he's going to be gifted a kill over onto Levy. Neskin, he's going to try and make that reverse push as well, but it really hasn't been successful here for Team 1. ADS and Lagonis now the last two alive. A oh, very aggressive oh. swing from Lagonis, but he will be taken on down. Four versus one, 25 seconds. KDS, get a lot of angles to check. Julio will be your undoing. Flank watch, you need a Nomad when you have a Julio. It's so unfortunate at the end as well, because Kamikaze actually started planting in that round, and he lost a ton of health from a Toxic Babe canister that came out to deny him. And I think the idea that he, he was going to go in for that plant, essentially while the others were busy doing other things, so there wasn't really enough of a defense to deal with that. But that's what pushed him out. And Lagonis, to be perfectly honest with you, probably could have landed a kill onto him, especially if he hasn't hesitated at the start. But um, I don't know, Kamikaze in the Bearing Nine, he just uh, came back at him. Um, which in and of itself was not the reason that they won the round, but when I saw Kamikaze start to lose a ton of health and NIP were getting involved in all of these, these different engagements, it looked kind of touchy because it looked like the central part of their plan was to get Kamikaze in and to plant. Well, that last round has put NIP onto a match and a series point here. They are poised, ready to be crowned the champions here inside of the Copa Elite 6 Stage 2 Finals. They have uh, been on quite the spree since 6 Invitational. I think this would be a nice addition to the trophy cabinet for them as they uh, are really looking to cement themselves as winners and champions at every single level and they're proving that here and now. One round is all that stands between them. Team 1 have a ways to go yet. They need to pick up three rounds on the bounce if they're going to hope to take this one into an OT. Well, let's see if they can do it. it would, if NIP win here, it would, of course, be the same scoreline that they got against Team Liquid. It would be very fitting. You can hear some drones going off in the distance. I'd say Julio's been doing a pretty decent job on the floors, to be honest. It's, um, it's not necessarily an operator that NIP bring all the time, but they've been pretty effective at it. I mean, we just saw that shield go down in kitchen, probably by a floors drone. Yeah, we got to ask Julio about the floors, and he said it's something that they were... Uh looking to really start to try and bring and it makes a lot of sense you know this map just screams flores if you think about it you're able to gather some info for free <gasps> lagonis it was either lagonis or alamo they've, they've not heard the drone there and it's going to give a little bit of information away it's not going to make the job any easier these players a team one that are trying to hold on to this top floor the site being kitchen the vertical control is very important indeed now the flores drones can start to come on through there's so much intel available here for nip you haven't got a great deal of drones remaining only three left alive but they've gathered a lot of that information a flores drone now going to come on in through the vent onto those white stairs c4 going to swing and miss from alamao things really hotting up here as we enter the final minute still all 10 men remaining you just know it's going to be a bloodbath regardless of which way it swings you just know that's how it's going to be Kamikaze is trying to hold on to some narrow angle through the service door. Muzi can see the feet. Oh no, Alamal, you're going to be the first death in this round and that could start to swing things towards NIP as Muzi can just hold on right here. Kamikaze from outside the service, continuing to play patiently and Ollie, all the kills are coming in. They really are. It's a very pressurizing situation now for KDS and Levy. We've seen Levy have a good couple of pop-off rounds tonight and he needs one here to keep team one in this thing. ADS looking to make a rotation in upstairs. A C4 that was pre-placed won't land anything, but Muzi's shots will. KDS now has a mountain to climb. He's got plenty of intel and he's going to find himself one, but it is not going to be enough. Who better than Julio to finish off the proceedings here tonight? That is going to lock 
NIP in. That is going to mean that they are the winners here inside of the Copa Elite 6 Grand Finals for Stage 2. So NIP have proven that they're the best team in the world and then they've come back to Brazil and proven once again that they are the best team in all of Latin America. And of course, both of these teams are going to be moving forward into the major that's going to be held in Mexico in August. And who knows, maybe they'll get to prove once again there that they are the, the best team in the world, I guess. Again? <laughs> It really is that thing from NIP at the moment. You just get the feeling that these guys are on the top of their game. They just want to go out there and win everything. Whatever the competition is, whether it's Six Invitation or whether it's the Copa Elite Six, whether it's going to be the Mexico Finals, Mexico Major, you know that they're going to have their eyes firmly set on that. These guys are looking to build and cement a legacy. They've been a team that has been threatening it for a very long time. And slowly but surely, they are making it a reality. As we say, they are going to be the winners here tonight. All of the teams that we've seen today, of course, already qualified for that major. So there's still plenty of siege on the horizon. But for tonight, NIP can celebrate and, uh, and relax in a, in a nice well-earned win. Yeah. And, and they also get all those SI points as well. You know, we mentioned the, the cash prize as well. But you can see on your, uh, your screens right now, sorry, 225 SI points to all of those top four um team so uh, that's a nice little bonus as well they of course want to be continuing their world domination i would imagine and um there's other teams as well so even though of course team one didn't quite win here they'll be going forward into mexico they're gaining those si points so they're working towards big things they really are let's bring riley back in here and have a bit of a recap of the way that today has uh, shaken on down what a performance from Ninjas in Pajamas. This is a team that is in it to win it until the final whistle blows. And I'll tell you what they've done it today. World Champions, LATAM League Final Stage 2 Champions as well. And as you mentioned, Gio, the ever-looming Mexico Major on the horizon. I reckon NIP are going to have something to say about that as well. A stunning performance from a team that really was tipped to uh, put in, you know, a huge weekend of work and they've been rewarded most richly with a ten thousand dollar cash prize 225 si points and more importantly than anything the fact they can just uh, rule the roost sit at the, the cocks of the walk there just like thank you very much yes indeed we've done it again in just pajamas <laughs> congratulations to them and of course before we move on too much further well done indeed to team one they've impressed all of us who've been watching the latam league have been watching the br6 this is a team that is on the up and up. There is a lot of their saga left to sing. And I wouldn't be surprised if we're sitting here at some point in the future congratulating uh, Team 1 on a big victory, Geo, because they've really got the chops. We saw them in Map 2. We've seen them throughout the group stages. They, they are a terrific team. Oh, I, yeah, there's there's no way that you can di deny that in, in any way. And I think that um, one of the things that we mentioned at the beginning of the game certainly comes into play here, and that is at NIP knew that if they were getting into the grand finals they they knew which opponent they were guaranteed and team one didn't have that so mm. they did come into this game with a bit of a disadvantage from that perspective um and you can't put everything down to that but i think that it, it does shine a little bit of light and uh, when you see the way that they did play throughout the course of the day throughout the course of this entire event all the way through the um the group stage as well you can certainly tell that uh, that they're a very capable team Looks like we've got Julio standing by for an interview. So let's uh, get underway with that. We're just waiting on for that final preparation to be made. And we can uh, we can hop in uh, with Julio here. Thanks for joining us, mate. Congratulations on the win. You must be you just must be over the moon with this performance. Uh, NIP really at the top of the world. Yeah, for sure. We are pretty happy. Uh, we're going to go to the major uh, pretty confident, you know. Uh, you know, we have, we, our Oregon is not that good right now. But gladly, we're going to fix that and for the measure, and yeah. yeah. I mean, Julio, you actually mentioned Oregon there. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't going to say anything about you not being that good. You shouldn't be that mean to yourself. But I was wondering, you know, you guys played Oregon quite a bit in stage one. And then for stage two, you basically didn't touch it. Um, and I was wondering if you'd maybe be able to shed some light on why that is, because obviously seeing you play it today feels kind of alien now. 
at Oregon for the for this playoffs or for the major, but I think it was not that good. I think it's better to play the map on the tournament. I, I think you know to get used to the map, and yeah, I think that was it. Yeah, I think um, it, it wasn't too much of a surprise to us to see you choose to play the the same maps that we saw. Uh, Team One and Fury are playing earlier on. It was the same maps, just a slightly different order. The Oregon Cafe and Coastline. W was that something that you guys were able to prepare for a little bit ahead of time in terms of knowing where you would be going if you got through Liquid, if you were going to get into the finals? You knew you were going to be playing Team One. Was there some sort of preparation there that went into that? I think not. We just play match by match, you know. We don't try to hide things and. There's some, some maps that we are confident, you know, uh, Café, Coastline, you're always gonna play or live on the third map. And uh, like, Coastline is not a map that you need to have a lot of strategies, you just need to adapt a lot and we are good on that. So yeah, things like that. I um, I, I have to ask because it was something that, that we, we all kind of discussed amongst ourselves, but um, specifically on Coastline, what was the decision to bring a Rook instead yeah, of the game? Yeah, <laughs> baby, you love to see it. Like, our game leader is crazy, he's just like, I'm gonna pick a hook and let's, you know, let's kill them. Not not that, uh, not that hard, you know, not that, like, uh, we didn't th think a lot about that, you know. We are free to pick whatever we want, whatever operation we want. Uh, we like to play like that, you know, uh, bring new ideas uh, mid-game. And yeah, Psycho did that, he, he was like, I'm confident with hook. You guys are gonna have some shield and yeah, let's trade, <laughs> trade kills. <laughs> Not that Amazing. complicated, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was certainly a highlight for me as a red, a red dot rook main. I, I really did love to see it. So thank you so much, nice. Julio, for the incredible performance you put on for us tonight, and well done once again on, uh, on proving that your team really is amongst the very best of the best. Thanks so much for joining us, mate, and best of luck in the upcoming major. Thank you, guys. I appreciate everyone cheering for us. We're gonna uh, practice a lot for the major. We're gonna gonna go pretty confident you know and do our game like we always do and yeah that's it go ninjas julio thanks for your time